lot going on here. Right All right. One, two, three. Hello. Welcome to Axe to Grind. Uh, without question, without doubt, uh, without any uh, semblance of, uh, uh, of uh, misgivings. Or humility. The, the best hardcore podcast in all of existence. Uh, I'm one of your hosts. My name is Patrick. I'm Bob. I'm Tom. And our guest today? Gavin Van Vlack. Now, Gavin, I'm going to put this delicately. To many of our listeners, mm -hmm. you need say no more. They know that name. But to maybe an equal number of our listeners, mm. I'd like you to give your resume a little bit or at least why you think we're interviewing you. Um, well, I think I'm fucking entertaining. First off, am I allowed to swear on this? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's... Uh, it wasn't guess, because we I, saw him down believe, at the corner. I yeah. believe that I believe it was it was me or the wino. <laughs> <laughs> the wino had better things to do. But he yeah he was looking for a couple bucks and you were just like let's go let's go I have fun for free I'm a whore. Um, yeah uh, my 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 pedigree or lineage let's see I I kind of grew up in the in in music I don't even say like so much the hardcore scene because I I originally come from like you know like I was like a metal kid. Mm -hmm. um, Where are you from originally? Originally, well, here's uh, let's 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 kill. I don't some, know this. Yeah. Let's kill. Let's kill some. Uh, let's kill some. Uh, some mythology here, right? Oh, well, I love I, killing mythology. Let yeah, tell. let's kill some mythology because I have like you know like I have like this New York hardcore pedigree, but I'm not, I'm actually a country kid. I grew up in New Hampshire. Mm. Oh, know? really? I grew up in uh, Upper New England, like New Hampshire, and Vermont. I'm uh, you know, I'm not like like you want to talk New Yorkers. Like, I mean, that's John Joseph, that's Jimmy Jimmy Drescher from Murphy's Law, mm. that's Harley Flanagan. Those kids, mm. those guys are New Yorkers. Mm. They're like died in the wall. I'm a country kid, man. I don't, I, I I claim nothing to be like you know. I, I, you know, I'm from the streets. Yeah, you know, I'm from a swamp. You know. Uh, <laughs> so we're gonna talk about Lake Winnipesaukee or uh, Lake Sun Lake Sunapee actually. Uh, oh, yeah. okay. And Lake Bombazine. Um, like Bobazine. Like, well, yeah. <laughs> Castle 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 in Vermont represent. Yeah, there um, we go. I like that. Uh which was you know, that that was like my introduction to punk rock was there. Because being a kid there, you there was nothing to do. And if you were into music, you were basically left to your own devices because it sucked. Right. Um so there was a college radio station in Castleton, and they played everything from Black Sabbath to Black Flag and the Spiz and X and the Sex Pistols and the Ramones uh. and all that stuff. And it was just a wide, wide variety of music. I was anything with a distorted guitar. I was into, and actually, my first my first musical influence was, and this is really weird, not influence, but my first musical experience, like, was Waylon Jennings. Huh. Yeah, because um, my mom drank a lot, and she would take mm -hmm. us to the bar. Yeah, the, and, the, uh, this is coming together now. Yeah, I was at a roadhouse bar, and uh, you the youngest, you the oldest. I'm the youngest and the only boy. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, my dad, my dad jettisoned like when I was like two years old. Hmm. Um, so it's like you know, like you know, like I jokingly say, like my family, my my parents did the best they could, which was leave and die. Oh. Um, <laughs> we get dark here, so it's all right, you know. Well, it's like always when I, when yeah. I hear people talk about their parents, and I'm just kind of like, oh, it's like watching monkeys at the zoo because they're like, I don't have a, I don't have a really good reference of parents, you know. It's like um, that sounds cool. I've yeah. seen the simulation. All right, yeah. like yeah, am I with that? Oh, really? Is that what it's like? Wow, glad I was an orphan. Yeah. Um, and. But uh, yeah, and when I was uh, about twelve years old, we moved down to we moved down to New York. My mom was originally from Bedford Stuyvesant, mm -hmm. and uh, my, you know my you know, like it, it's you know it was like Freddie Alva did a thing about Latinos and hardcore, mm -hmm. and you know it's like it became people. Like, oh, I didn't know you were Mexican. I'm like, well, I don't go around wearing a Mexican flag, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's sombrero, well, you know, name, sombrero. Uh, well, but, yeah, it's, well, it's well, it's I'm half Dutch, half Mexican, oh, right. wow. um, and. Uh, it was, uh, we moved down here and it was really weird because my mom wanted to be close to the city for her family, but it was kind of tough because I just got into a lot of fights. I got the shit beat out of me on a regular basis. Did you move back to like New York City or Brooklyn? Or? We moved back to New York City right. and uh, we- why, why were we getting in fights? Because uh, back then, like we had moved to Pitt Street first. Mm -hmm. wow. And then we had moved to Bed-Stuy and then, because my mom was insistent on, on kind of a- uh, 
like being close to family. And my oldest sister lived up in Westchester and she was like, mom, mm -hmm. you're sick. Yeah. And my mom was really like, you know, she had cancer. So she was on mm -hmm. uh, morphine sulfate and a shitload of pills. It was just all pain management yeah. at this point. So we moved up to Westchester and uh, how old are you? God, at that point, I'm still like 12. Yeah. Yeah. I, I you know, yeah. I, I major ass whoopings for the, like six months. And, uh, because it was like, you know, mostly like, like Puerto Rican and black kids. And you're like, and the, like, new yeah, like the, the new kid. The new kid. And that's how kids, kids wow. we know this. Kids are fucking ruthless. Yeah. You'll be in a 12-year-old you know? movie. Yeah. And, and, and we're, don't and care where you're moving. It and they're easy. pack animals, you know. And yeah. uh, so it was like, you know, we went up to Westchester and it was... Uh, it was interesting because I still come down to the city. I would go to like you know go to shows at the, like at the like not even shows concerts like at Madison yeah. Square Garden and like you know different places like that. And uh, you know the the one thing I had was was well the two things I had were music and athletics because yeah. I've always been an athletic kid. Because when I was really young, like when I was like six years old, I was waking up and I ran a trap line. Like I, because basically myself yeah. and my sisters worked to like kick in for the family because my sure. mom was sick. My yeah. oldest sister was the man of the house. She yeah. worked three jobs to put herself through college and support the family. Jesus, um, yeah, she's shout you know, out big sister. Yeah, she, Donna Donna Van Vlack is more of a man than most of the people I fucking know. Um, What's she doing now? Um, she lives in Pennsylvania. She's married. She works. She has worked in statistical arbitrage, which for those who don't know, they eat babies. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> that's, it's, it's a division in the stock market, which basically they, they it's, it's really, really ruthless. Baby trading future. And she's, cool. yeah, she's, she's been in that Parts. for a long time. And she's, um, I mean, she was my best man at my wedding. That's right. You know, yeah. Uh, and my other Shout sister, my other sister lives up in uh, up in Spanish Harlem. She's rad as hell. She's an actress. Um, she's getting you know, getting after her art. And Stephanie's really just you know made a good made a good life for herself. But yeah, it was really kind of tough, especially growing up where we did, where you know we're half half breed, so we might as well just been Mexican. Right. I mean, we were we were wet bags. Ugh. You know that we heard that, and my oldest sister. This is one thing. It's like she's. Uh, this is really difficult to say. We come from different fathers. Yeah, but I've never called her my half sister because she's never shown me half love. Right. right. You know. Um, but her family, like the Dutch side of the, my family, didn't want to know of us because we're you You're know we're, we're we're half breeds. You know, and but she her her family um, was. Just kind of like you know, they were like they treated her like a second class citizen until she became successful. Then all of a sudden, everybody, everybody wanted to like was like, oh, you know, Donna, you're you're, like, you're the shit. That's the weird how we need to work on. We got to get that success <laughs> level up, and then maybe this podcast is it, right? Yeah. Huh? You know, get the and full I've learned so much from her. Just you know, it's just you can't let that shit get to you because a lot of people get resentful over that kind of shit like oh you know like and I'm the first one man I will I will harbor a, like I will harbor a grudge like it's a puppy you know it's like <laughs> oh, oh, I'm, oh I'm gonna show you yeah, you know it's like and I, will, I will nurse that thing into a feral canine basically <laughs> um, and it's a bad it's a bad bad behavior but then back to like upbringing like it was in Westchester and it was it was interesting because being in Vermont you didn't have exposure to like 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 shows and stuff like that being in Westchester there were kids who were more into what I was into like yeah. also being Mexican and being into punk rock and being into metal not fucking cool at that time in, no. in there you know um, but there were other kids that were into music and then all of a sudden also this 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 weird black music called hip hop mm. right. you know which I was like Wow, this is fucking cool. Westchester, 94 the Bronx. And yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And you start to get all these musical influences, and uh, then starting to go to the, the Anthrax, the original Anthrax, mm. which was in Stamford, Connecticut. Mm. It was the basement was owned by the Sheridan Brothers, and from there you meet kids and you started going to the city to shows, and it was all like a. It, it, there's a there's a quote by I mean and I love my biological family what I have of it but yeah. there's a quote by Dan Savage which I think is very poignant you have your biological family and then you have your logical family <laughs> you know yeah. and I come from a generation of kids in the hardcore scene that we were raised by wolves and drag queens yeah you know so it's kind of like I um, think that's lost on people now that connection to like like for hardcore kids like 
true freak shit, true different stuff. Like, see, here's the thing. And, and, uh, Gingy Brown, a singer for Absolution, said something that was very, very, very poignant about his love of music and how, like, he's really into punk rock and he's into disco. And Gingy, for those who don't know Gingy, after Absolution, he recorded with like Shockley. He recorded like the Grave Diggers. He did all this hip hop stuff. He did some major stuff as like an engineer. Or as an engineer, yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, now he DJs in Florida. Like he's yeah, big, down in Miami. Does, right? the, yeah, he does house, right. and he's an amazing house DJ. Right. Um, but he's we were talking about it because we both have this love for old disco and old punk rock, which uh, like you know which back then we're yeah, really but like yo, urgent, yo really. Roger said it best, man. Never trust a hardcore kid who wasn't like into punk. who didn't like punk, sure. and like that's like R A and hip hop. R A the rugged man said, I I can't talk hip hop with you if you don't know who Cool G Rap is. Mm-hmm. You know, it's Good that point. simple. Because we bring that up all the time by young kids that it's like young rappers or young hardcore kids that like don't know the pillars yeah. and they only go so far back and it's like yeah. and I'm not saying anymore. and yeah. I'm not saying because you know I of all people have always been like don't romance about the past because yes. you're letting the present slip by sure well and that's you know? the hard part right now is like young people want what's in the moment and sometimes we we kind of talk about it. we're like yo we get closer? some of the classic hardcore you know if I got in stuff in the mid 90s the stuff that was going on in the early 80s, late 70s, that didn't feel like a thousand miles away. Yeah. If you were born in the mid or late 90s, you go, yo, you trying to talk to me about 1980? I can't even listen to that. Yeah. And it's this weird disconnect. And so one of the things we try to do is make it so it's like, yo, no, that stuff still feels vibrant. It still feels alive. When I listen to it, I'm like, I can't, I can't see how this doesn't resonate to a 20-year-old now, 20 years from now, or 20 years ago. Yeah. You know what I mean? So well, some music is absolutely timeless. Like you, th- I mean, think about when I was born, like '68. Mm-hmm. What was happening then? Shit like the Stooges and MT- MC5, yeah, which right. to me is like here's the, there was always the big battle of like, oh, who created punk rock? Was it yeah. London? Was it New York? It was <laughs> neither. Yeah. It was Detroit. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it was Detroit, and then it's like you know it's. You know, if you think about Detroit's contribution to music from like R and B and soul, blues, punk rock, Mm -hmm. techno, the early, the early, the early, early techno came out of Detroit. You know, Um, and it's just, you know, and I just, I, I love music. Um, I don't think there's ever been a time that I've always been about like one style of music, and I've always been. I'm in. I mean. I'm a very I'm an easy easy to dictate person. I'm very trendy, super trendy. Is that right? Oh, You're absolutely. Guy, like, no, because no. I'm, uh, trendy in the way it's easy to di- like I said, easy to dictate. Because once everything starts going this way, go I'm the, going the other direction. Oh, oh, you go the, I'm oh, naturally oh, yeah, I'm just habitually uh, iconoclastic. Yeah. I'm a, not contrarian. Just, I'm iconoclastic. I don't believe in okay. That's being done. Mm. Cool. You got that handled. I'm gonna find this. I want to find this. Hmm. You know? is, that, is that what resonates with the hardcore? Because it seems like no matter what, hardcore's always going to be that over there. You know what I mean? Until it's this. Yeah? You know? Well, yeah. I mean, it's because after a while, shit gets so homogenous. And I think to me, hardcore, and getting back to it, like the hardcore that I love was stuff that was different. Like, you know, mm-hmm. you asked me about my top fives. And a right. lot of those bands, you played those for like now kids now that are into like say Jesus piece. Oh, this is rock and roll. Right. Like the adolescents or X or right. shit X, like that. Yeah, of course. You know. Yeah. But you got to understand where that stuff comes from. And when we get back to the whole disco and punk rock thing, with disco and punk rock, it didn't matter what background you came from, what gender specificity you were, right. all of that stuff. But then. With hardcore and hip hop, there was this kind of kind of dominant alpha attitude, which to me became a little bit exclusionary. I think no doubt there's like so a lot of people would ID the difference between punk and hardcore yeah. as sort of depending on your viewpoint, either a rampant unhealthy masculinity, yeah. or if a more charitable way to put it would be like. A bit of a, 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 like a bit. I don't even know if that's more charitable. No, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was, I was gonna, Say the fucking words. Like a, a little bit of an alpha to to not pecking order. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it yeah, doesn't. Right. But it, it's rough because while I see all of those criticisms very clearly, you know what I mean. I, I also it just appeals to me more. 
Do you understand? Hardcore over punk? Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, it's... uh, No, I understand that, too. I understand that, too. But there's... uh, And I'm not... uh, I'm I'm the last person to go and blast uh, masculinity. Because I think, quite honestly, right now, there's a... You know, the word man is a four-letter word, it seems to be. Mm -hmm. Um... You know, and I'm not going. I'm not going to front on on my on my own. Like, yeah, the, I, I I I'm a I'm a 240 pound, like you know, ex competitive fighter. Yeah. You know, you know, it's like I I'm very very secure within like who I am. Yeah. But because I'm that, I shouldn't be judged as like. I like I get it all the time. Well, you you like to fuck people up. I'm like, well, not really. Right. I mean, there is, there is. I have certain tools that I can use. Right. You know? Right. And certain tools that like, you know, and it's funny because there was a, there's, there's a situation that happened where um, someone kind of crossed a line to me and I was like, did you think for a second that like, oh, that I'd gotten too old and soft in the teeth? Or that like, oh, well, no, you're sober now. I, I, I've just been waiting for someone to cross that fucking line yeah. and you did it. You just did it. You I know? Can, you know how, when I can ID, ID a hard man? When he says there was a situation that happened, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how I can identify. That's somebody. a good identifier of yeah. a problem situation. For, for people yeah. at home, if somebody says uh, there was a situation that happened, if that's how they proceed the, their story, it usually ends with an ass kicking. So <laughs> yeah, I, I thought I could ID where that was yeah, going. And uh, but to me, it's like I have a different, I have a different concept on what like like the alpha male is like if like yeah. my friends who I consider like it's it's no I mean I'm, Tate Fletcher is a really really good friend of mine mm. and I look at Tate Fletcher and Tate Fletcher is like a protector mm-hmm. Tate Fletcher is like one of the most warm loving open has no problem with making himself vulnerable to learn new things and to me to be like a, a true quote unquote alpha because here's the thing you're never going to el- erase alpha from the society this is what we have we have right. alpha females just as much i i work i work in a martial arts gym i am around some incredibly highly enforced alpha females some of our athletes are amazing yes. in that factor but they do not abuse that mm-hmm. you know well you sound like at this point you sound like a when you talk to like a real martial artist, this is always what it boils down to. Right. You know, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. it always, anytime you talk to a real deal martial artist, right. it always is at some point goes, but obviously I prefer not. Right. Yeah. Very respectful. <laughs> like, well, yeah. and, and I mean, and the other side is the idea like, like gender. And like right now we're talking, gender's like this big conversation in the country and in people like identifying themselves. And what you said is right. Man can be a four letter word. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of we talk about it a lot is the idea of what man means and like you use some descriptors to describe this guy who's you're like this guy's an yeah. alpha he's warm he's loving he's protective yeah. and and I think he's he's willing to be vulnerable and those aren't words that people connect though that's what we should be working towards is that those two things man vulnerable warm loving all these things caring sensitive emotional yeah. like those don't have to be mutually at odds. Exclusive. Those are not yeah. mutually exclusive. Absolutely. And in the same respect, for female, alpha, strong, dominant, those things aren't exclusive either. Those Yo, things let, me, let me pipe it right, right, right now. And anybody who's familiar with Jessica Pimentel, yeah. you want to talk alpha. You want to yeah. talk, talk about a woman who fucking breathes fire. Mm-hmm. You know? You know who she is? And... Uh, she, uh, it's funny because for the longest time, I I watched I, I I you know I watched her go through like her development and how she you know how she goes about things and how she takes care of herself and like and it's just so amazing to watch like my friends who I'm around like her grow. Yeah. You know, what they come out of and what they come from. Yeah. And she's very, very similar to Tate in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and that's the thing. Like, uh, I mean, there's another one of our, one, another one of our, uh, our athletes, uh, this, this woman, Sarah Carswell, who I, you know, I, I see, like, I watched her come into the gym and she always had this presence and she was very, very, like, 
keen to learn, very focused. And she's come into this role now at the gym where she's kind of she she is kind of this alpha mother, right? You know, yeah. which I love. Yo, how about I love the term, fact right? that I, I love the alpha fact mother. that I love the fact that she kind of, her 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 walkout song when she fights is "Call Me Mother" by RuPaul. <laughs> she, she, yeah, she's she is just by all definitions badassery. Yeah. Um, you know, and then you think about women within our scene, like yeah. very few people will remember IJT Records, Jen Topper, yep. mm-hmm. Jen Topper, another woman who was brilliant, yeah. you know, yeah. and we have these people around us. We have, you know, like these Roger Murrays, these, right. you know, Purcells, mm-hmm. the people that we have amongst us um, that I consider to be kind of proper alphas, mm-hmm. Jake Bannon. Jake yeah. Bannon, for as as downplayed as he is to himself, very quiet, very. Right. But there's there's something about him that is just very you cannot fuck with. Right. Yeah. You yeah. know. Right. Um. There, there, there is a way that these people are forged. Right. You know, there's a way that these people are made, and that that I think people can learn from. Do you, you think know. they're just so comfortable that they can allow themselves to kind of? It takes a long time to get comfortable. To, like, in your own I was in, co- I, dude. I was in. Like I joke about how like I'm a huge fan of drugs and alcohol. Being 16 years <laughs> sober, but that, congratulations on that. Yeah, that's a big thing. That yeah. got me. That got me to where I am because like that point, drugs and alcohol were a tool. You know, it went from uh, it went from like basically like magic to maintenance to madness. Right. And uh, oh. you know, so it was uh You'll hear a lot of LA, AA, LA, AA uh, talk talk for me, yeah. and it's uh, but uh, it's because I, I didn't really have you know I, I talk about my growing up yeah. and you know all that stuff, and I used to well, I remember when I first got sober, I was big bitching about oh my god and this that and the other thing, yeah. and I was one guy like thirty five years sober looked at me goes like well aren't you glad that's over. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of you know, and that's what it was for me. And uh, God, I forget. So, so you said something that was so you just weren't secure. You weren't comfortable in your own skin. No, absolutely. Well, I think like Like, that's something I think people need to hear and be able to talk about. Part of it is like growing up being being kind of like you know, not really sure of yourself and. uh, you know, the, like, there was always there was, and it's not like you know, I'm not saying like we grew up with with racism. It's not like we had people burning crosses on our lawns, right? But there was right. always kind of like you're a second class citizen because right. you're half Mexican. And I'm right. friend, I mean, I'm still friends with a lot of kids that I went to grade school with. That's right. You know, I say right. I, I I'm in contact because of like you know the magical book of faces, yeah. you know, <laughs> and but the, like the the kids were awesome. Yeah, but. It's it, there was a big change when we came down to the city, and it was kind of like instant, I was instantly transformed into a white boy. Yeah, you were moved from right. Where yeah, you were a Latino down, in a down to the city, yeah. and, and like, I speak so I, at that point no no Spanish Spanish. Mm-hmm. Right, you know, right, right, right. I speak more Thai than I do Spanish. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's it was it was you know a lot of that, and then it was kind of weird because. I started drinking at a really early, early age because right. it was just accessible, and drugs at a really, really early age because it was accessible. I had, I had Percodan and Percocet and Brompton's cocktail around the house. I was like a Jeez. little fucking junkie, Holy shit. you know. But even back in Vermont. Oh yeah, yeah. Not this even is like. To the city. Oh no, no. This is like at six, seven years old. Jesus. Like, yeah, like I went in for my first transfusion at like seven. Mm. I drank shit. myself into a fucking like just. Passed out on the right. doghouse in the backyard. Oh man. Jesus Christ! Yeah, and uh, yeah, woke up in the hospital. Getting a transfusion at seven. Yeah, like that's the kind of shit that you're lucky you made it past ten. Yeah, you know what I mean, right? Like, yeah, but I mean, here's the you, thing did about you it. ever see six and seven year olds and how small they are and think about that. It's oh, crazy. absolutely. Well, I've I've been I've been to Thailand. I've been to Jakarta. I've been to Mexico. I've seen I, I've seen I've seen four year old five year old kids with cigarettes. Oh, you know, it's true. like. Um, but uh, well, you think of Easton, and you put I know in that I have a four-year-old son, yeah, and it's just it's like, like uh, yeah, because you, know, you don't think about um, you know how often am I around a four or five-year-old? It's, now? it's yeah. not, it's not, a, it's all about like I'm very sure of it. I'm not exactly, you know, like, I'm very sure the second I learned that spinning around in circles 
feels would would give me that same feeling effect. Get, same effect <laughs> I did it until I fell the fuck down and you're like yeah. alright I'm good yeah exactly <laughs> but it this was is what like, I was looking for this is my high but it was like it, 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 it made sense and then there was a long span for a while I think from the time I was probably about nine years old until I got to be about 14 that I really didn't do anything and there was there was kind of like I was doing sports I was doing athletics and I was trying to like trying to fit in right because that was also part of your life even from a yeah. young age doing that yeah. what was your go to sport um, well I grew up my mom put me into wrestling mm-hmm. um, and then lacrosse oh wow okay. uh, and uh, you got nice ears for a wrestler my friend yeah lucky. <laughs> well, they're tight to my head that's yeah. why <laughs> um, yeah really for all the stuff and then I, and I played fo- I played football as well right but uh, it then it was, but it was like, it, to me, it was always, I was trying to fit in, but I didn't fit in. And then I remember it was like, I was at some show and someone offered me a beer and I was like, yeah, sure. Why the fuck not? I mean, I didn't really know about straight edge or anything like that. Right. And uh, I had a beer and all of a sudden I was like, oh, I remember this. This is rad. <laughs> all right. Wow. I wish I had a butt. Like, yeah. <laughs> great, great kind of weird drug stories. Jason Surface from Crackdown and I. On Tompkins Square Park bench doing whippets. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> we're, I think we we're like 17 years old. Right? <laughs> I remember we were just sitting there, just like zoned out doing whippets. If anybody knows those whippets, like nitrous oxide. And Jason just turns to me and like, I wish I had a button on the side of my neck I could press. It would make me feel like this. <laughs> <laughs> That's called the Nas button. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. And anybody who doesn't know who Crackdown is, Jason Surface yeah, was. Down one of the like such a great front man just a, such a great person and fucking just man when he got pushed over the other edge was just yeah lethal yeah lethal lethal human being just wiry ballistic <laughs> and big fucking hands oh, absolutely. You know, it's kind of very similar to like Ezek where D- you know Dandy's got that like, really wiry built but he's, but he's got, got these fucking big hands brick hands, hands. Yeah. that's all you need and I've, and I've seen I've seen Dan Dandy's got natural boxing ability yeah, yeah I've, I've seen that yeah. <laughs> I've seen him I, it's like, I've seen him knock people out oh yeah yeah, yeah. you know um, question about yeah. ab- about the uh, so you're going to shows at this time we're talking whip it time yeah uh, how uh, how druggy is the scene at that point? How druggy is New York? In like Lots. 1985, Lots. 86. He's looking Lots. at it, he's yes. looking at you like what you what yeah. you know about it. But like what? Lots. But but because this is is this pre this well, is like youth of today is not, not here yet, yet, right? Youth of today is not bringing the suburbs kids youth in yet. Th- no, youth of today was around. Yeah, and the straightest thing was around because that's I mean, like Ray and Purcell have they've always been. Yeah, they're that. coming around from like eighty five. They've always on, been yeah. that. Yep. they've always been that. That's their, their, you know, that's their thing, you know? And it's, I mean, not their thing. It's like their, you know, but it's like that's their identity and who right. they are, right. you know? Right. Um, and uh, I was, you know, I, I've been friends with those guys for a long time. I ran with that bunch. And there was just certain things about it, which I was like, it didn't feel. Right. It wasn't my thing. Yeah. Right. You know? But and so I, you were also, so you'd run with those dudes, but then also be at the park. Yeah, <laughs> we cracked down. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, but it was like you know, because that's a, I mean, at the time we're like sixteen, yeah, you know, sixteen, seventeen years old. You're still trying to really figure out who the fuck you are. Mm-hmm. I mean, scientifically, it's it's proven you your prefrontal cortex doesn't contact your amygdala until you're like twenty five to twenty six years old. <laughs> right. So you're still a fucking child soldier. And you're <laughs> especially thinking about that. You're in this weird social scene too of yeah. fucking hardcore and punk yeah. in New York where things are just exploding and there's this and this and there's these guys and these guys there and was, you're trying to figure your way out. Yeah. There was so much like really just like amazing stuff going on. Like bands that I think are like, you know, everybody think like, you know, there's, there's always going to be the Chrome Mags and the Bad Brains <laughs> and Agnostic mm-hmm. Front Murphy's Law. Mm-hmm. But bands like, you know, everybody knows Antidote, but like Wolfpack, Ultraviolence. Yeah. Um, you know, from Albany, like Albany style, fit for abuse, uh, violent children, yeah. uh, CIA. There were so many cool bands that just kind of like pushed to the pushed to the wayside, like they, they kind of like off to the memory graveyard in a way. Um, it was really just you know, but there was just there was this. It was a lot of fun, yeah. But there was a certain point where it got super super violent, mm. and uh, I kind of pulled away 
from. It's like late eighties, early nineties when it got late eighties, really, really, yeah. early nineties, right. and I kind of pulled away from that. I started. There was other things going on, like in Williamsburg, particularly at that point, because Burn had built, like you know, it's kind of started. You know, I was in Absolution before that, which right. we had already. We were already. I mean, we were living like Sergio, Sergio Vega, and Gingy lived on Hope Street. Uh, right. Which we thought was the most ironic name for that neighborhood. <laughs> at that time. Like, you know, <laughs> exactly. There's not a lot of hope. Um, that's true. But uh, you know, and uh, yeah, we like it was. How, can you explain just because I want to get right back to this? Explain New York to someone who was born after 1990. <laughs> explain New York in the 80s. You know what I mean? Um, because I was I was a child. I lived upstate in yeah, Albany, and yeah. my father worked in the city. When I would come down with him, when my mother would allow me, I wasn't allowed to not hold his hand or go here or there, and I was I had to be in his eyesight at all times. Here's, it's weird to describe it because for me, as you know, a, a pedestrian, someone walking around, it was kind of like there was every corner had danger and excitement, and it was kind of like there was always. You never knew if you were going to walk down an alley if you were going to get, like, mugged or you were going to walk into this amazing fucking party. <laughs> it was, you know, you just right, never... Yeah, right. You never fucking knew. And uh, I love stories like... Like, you talk like... Uh, like, Dan Cav. Uh, Dan mm-hmm. Cav talks yeah. about, like, yeah, he, he well. grew up in Greenpoint. And he's like, yeah, I remember my mom would... Like, we used to get... We used to be on 2nd Avenue heading downtown. And at 14th Street, she'd lock all the doors and run all the lights straight I mean, down to Delancey to get across. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's you know, Bullshit. and that's what it was, and it's so strange because the city has grown, and I appreciate it, but there's so many social reference points that are gone, mm. and you know the venues, and it's it's foolhardy of me to carry like sentimentality about those things because you know all things are like. All things are fleeting and impermanent, and I'm mm-hmm. not meaning to sound like some kind of fucking guru. But you no, we come get to that, pretty granola in here. You so come yeah. to that. You come to that realization, and it's really kind of like you know, it's like you you know, you, I, I you identify with certain things like Tompkins Square Park, like Avenue A, like all that stuff, and then you know, like I think a bigger point for me because that that stuff was important, but I think what was really in, in like with absolution and burn because we lived in we didn't really live lower east side so to speak at that point we were in williamsburg mm. which was even more what the Marley, lower east yeah. side was like like it was amazing because if you if you, it gave it, it availed so many opportunities yeah. to do creative stuff if that's yeah. what you were and like do bands and do graffiti and you know like just express yourself yeah and at a certain point, like around, like I think it was '88 when I, and I could be wrong, because '88 is when ba- I think the Baker Beach party started, which was what started Burning Man. Oh wow! And oh, wow. there, and there was, there was kind of a, a backlash on the East Coast, in Williamsburg at the because every like the whole White Avenue and all that, all those warehouses yeah. were fucking abandoned. Yeah. yeah. And like myself and like like uh, like Stack. And Sane and Smith and Ghost, like all these graffiti writers, we right. would go down there because you could hang out all friggin' day long. And you no, could, like, yeah. yeah, you'd bring a bunch of beers, you'd bring some food, and you would just do a mural. Right. Yeah. And you'd hang out. The there, cops yeah. didn't give a damn. Yeah. Right, right, right. And, uh, and it was crazy because I remember one time, the first time we happened onto it, we had. We had gone. We had gone. We had done these murals. Like I think it was like myself, Sane, Stack, Hush, and like our whole entourage had done these murals. And we decided to go. We were like, we were kind of like hanging out, drinking beers, being being kids. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, let's go to the warehouse and fucking hang out. We'll light a garbage can on fire. Da da da. You know, just chill. Yeah. And we got there, and we had no idea what was going on because our pieces had become the backdrop for this huge fucking rave rave party <laughs> pre-techno like right. this art party we walked in and there's a 30 foot high wall of TVs on static with different things flashing music playing uh, people doing art like just yeah. and we're like right. what the fuck, what the fuck yeah. planet did we just walk <laughs> right, into right. <laughs> and being a kid at that age you're like yeah. it's just astounding oh, yeah. and it opened up a lot more for me away from like let's say the general like CBGB's punk rock scene right sure. 
you know, which is like, that's what I think you had the division of the CBGB's punk rock, the CBGB's hardcore thing, and then the ABC No Real, which right. came up. Yeah. And you guys kind of like, you did we, both. You, we walked the tightrope right. on that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, was, and ABC No Real was equally important, in my opinion. And I know someone's going to throw fucking tomatoes at their fucking, uh, Whatever. at me for this. Really, equally as important as fucking as CBGB's was. We're, we're right. very quick to dispel CB's. CBGB's, a lot of good stuff happened there. It a lot wasn't good- relative for the, it wasn't relevant for the past 10 years, but it was open. No, right. and it was yeah. just Maybe a show. Longer, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, they never know. gave the folks that built it the credit. They, they, hardcore, they. I mean, at the very end, when things place. were going to total no, shit, no, 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 hardcore did not make CBGBs. Are you gonna tell me like television? I'm gonna tell you Talking Heads. I'm gonna yeah. tell okay. you Blondie. Okay. I'm gonna tell you, but hardcore Rich, tell you Richard Hell. Exist to them. <laughs> what? Hardcore doesn't even exist when they do the history of CBs. Uh, the, the the way, the nobody's done. Nobody's done the right history yet. Here's the thing. What, did you did you see the videotape of when they dragged David Byrne out of there kicking and screaming because he was going to kick this dude's ass? No. <laughs> yeah, well, there's plenty of video of hardcore kids doing that. We were a pain in Hilly Pistol's <laughs> ass. Fair. Uh, <laughs> all right, yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know? Fair. Okay. No. You know, what was what was the worst? Of, like, 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 you know, like someone like someone me. Someone stole his big so, yeah, Someone like <laughs> me or Tommy Carroll get, try, getting into a fight with like five or six fucking skinheads. Or fucking Iggy yeah. Pop giving someone a blowjob in the back room. That's true. Like, yeah. It's like, yeah, really, it yeah we didn't help. Really. Our, hardcore kids didn't help themselves. That's fair. Yeah. Okay. Fair. The Iggy Pop story's better, right? Let's, let's be real. <laughs> like, that's a cool story. There's only yeah. one story like that. There's a hundred yeah. stories of someone getting. So, yeah. Exactly. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> sure. I mean, fair. Everyone's like, oh, they didn't show the hardcore scene. We've done a perfectly good job of promoting ourselves. Fair. Drew Stone has done a great documentary. Mm. There's a ton of great documentaries on hardcore. You know what? Quit pretending that oh, we didn't get our due. We did this. We did that. Shut the fuck up. Is that what it sound like? <laughs> no. <I asked. laughs> Yo, that's only after sitting, hard workout. Yeah, hard workout. I'm sitting there after like, Jenny kills me. That's what I sound like. Like fucking like, wow, I sound like fucking Paul Barrow. <laughs> Yo, Squad is right. Sound like you're right listen, and left. Listen, yeah. Mo. Yeah. So, so, no. But we, we're, quick, we're quick to drop <laughs> CB. CB's, it, was, it did its thing. It's cool. But it gets a lot of hype. ABC doesn't get as much talk. Especially not to like hardcore kids. And yo... ABC was started. Well, it wasn't started. It existed, but it it comes into ABC, everyone's. ABC existence. No Real originally was it was an after hours club because I worked as a bar back at the Pyramid, and after the Pyramid would close, a I'm lot like of the drag, a lot of the drag queens. And this is talking like this is back. This is like Babyface, um, Babyface the drag queen. Yeah. Uh, like RuPaul was just starting out at that point. Right. Um, Lady Bunny. They would all go down, and there was an after hours club down there. Right. Where I mean, like Todd, Todd, uh, Todd Youth and mm-hmm. and and Ray Bees used to have to escort them down there so they wouldn't get beaten up. No shit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sure. They, that whole the gay the gay community and the like, hardcore scene have always been like you know. Like linked, it's always been like in New York since the seventies. Yeah, New well, York. I mean, it's true. Jimmy and Ray worked the door at the Pyramid, which was the queen of clubs back right. in the day. Right. It originally started, you know, and they also worked at A Seven. Right. You know, which is all. I mean, sadly, like that's the that's the birthplace of hardcore, not CBGBs. Like oh, what we did, what we did for hardcore. Right. Like you know, the whole television, uh, Dead Boys punk rock thing. Right. That's CBGBs, but. Like you know, actual hardcore, actual like American hardcore. hardcore. Yeah, it was like A7. I never mm-hmm. went there. No. no. You know, a little too early. No. Yeah, and it was like, you know, but that was where, like, you know, kids like Harley, Roger, Jimmy, you know, the guys from The Abuse, the Beastie Boys, mm-hmm. the right. Bad Brains. All went. All, but they, they, all they, they, that's where that was, that was, the, that was the crucible where that was forged. True. Fair. You know? That's true. So, turn from the ring. so you get to, you're in you're in Williamsburg and you're getting to see a world that isn't just the CBGB's hardcore scene. You're is that expanding your horizon? You're also working yeah, because there was, at that point too. There was bands that were starting out like like the Unsane were starting out. Uh, Bark Market. There was a band called Dig That Hole, which morphed into Cop Shoot Cop. No one. Um, okay. All of that kind of stuff, which to me was just really fantastic. I was like, wow, this is fucking cool. Yeah. And this is all in Brooklyn. This is all in like like Unsane whole... was like a Williamsburg band. Yeah, right? yeah, which is wild. Yeah. Yeah. This is the first we've had our first Burning Man reference and and, and un... our first Bark Market reference. Have we gotten yeah. Unsane in here before? We yes, have. We I, have. I'm, I'm an Unsane. I miss the Unsane show, but I, well, yeah. I'll tell I'll tell anybody this right now. If you have not gone out and listened to Elron by Bark Market, you are 
not allowing yourself. I mean, there's there's something with music with me. It's a very important thing. Music should there's one of two things that should inspire you. It should make you want to fuck or kill or both. both. Walk, that walk record does detail. both. Both. <laughs> oh, that record is so sexy. All right. Sexy and all. That record. That record is like a fist fight in a bar leading into sex in the bathroom. I'll give it that. <laughs> that's a that's a good vibe. I mean, you were an early I'm Amrap adopter, correct? I mean, like you were into that before it became a thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I th- that, that that to me, I just thought was just much more. I like grit. Yeah, right. You know? I like grit. Yeah. You know, there's something. Right. There's something in there that 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 resonates with me. So you know? so how'd you end up playing what you like? If though if that's what you, uh, was appeal appealing to you at the time, right? If yeah. that scene, that sound, like which was pretty diverse, people doing a lot of different shit. How'd you end up continuously playing hardcore? Because people Bro- call me a hardcore musician. <laughs> <laughs> you got get- when Burn first came out, everyone was like. Oh well, it's oh, too yeah. metal. Yo, what yeah, was that? Because all, all of your bands were weird for the time. Yeah, right? I yeah, mean, that's true. Absolution that's true. was not. That's was right. Not, it was not. I mean, Absolution was really me, basically trying to be, and I've said this before, being Wes Montgomery with a distortion pedal. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so how did you? Uh, uh, now I understand this is a disease that hits so many of us, where all we're hardcore dudes, all our friends are hardcore people, and then suddenly those are the only shows that we're allowed to play, right? Those are the only shows we're getting invited to. That, that, is that's that kinda, what happened? It, it is a lot of the time, but it's like, the thing about Burn is that we played with like, you know, we played with KRS-One. We yeah. played with like, yeah. we played with huge, like, Absolution, you know, we played with fucking Living Color. Mm-hmm. You know, we did... That would have been a fun show. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was at Central Park. That's cool. That's Rock and Racism. Um... But it's, you know, we've played, and I think that shows should be varied. I think that, like, you know, I don't, I think, you know, it's like, you know, you want, here, here's a bowl of milk. We're going to put some more milk in that. Oh, yeah. how about some heavy cream? Here, we put some, uh, we'll put some low fat in there. And uh, we're going to throw in a, a stick of butter. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like. All variations on the same fucking exactly. thing. Exactly. Yeah. Here, here's, here's some Let's cheese. put some chocolate yeah. in there. <laughs> Let's, Let's change it up. Put some cheese. Yeah, you know, it's like, chocolate at least would. It's different. It That's out. what I'm saying. Let's put some chocolate because I think a lot Let's of put times, some fucking pepper in that shit. A lot yeah. of times, people think '80s hardcore dudes, dudes in it, would be more traditionalists, especially as. A, but you're saying no. You would have liked to have seen it mixed up even more. Fuck yeah. Yeah, because I mean, and I, I think, think that's, that's why wrong. you kind of went between ABC, where you'd play with like a Rorschach, a and Merrill. then go to CB yeah. or whatever, and play with fucking whoever. You know, well, eventually, crushed. even I like, like I mean, yeah. even even where it was like you know, like when and people like you know, people always like absolution burn, but die one sixteen, yeah. die one sixteen was an was a yeah. rolling art, art rock nightmare. Yeah. Right. You know, we basically. I, I didn't give a fuck and I remember people just like you know trying to categorize it I'm like why do you have to fucking categorize what I'm doing yeah. can't you just like, like it, it right it now is. you know that you know they can't now <laughs> yeah. you've had plenty of years to learn the people are yeah. totally incapable I mean, of that. that's like leading down to like what I'm doing now um yeah. Awkward segue. Yeah, no, that was good. No, no, no that, was that was good. That was on smooth. Promo yeah, yourself. Do it. Do the, the plug. Can, well, the canonized stuff is basically, um, I, I have you know like, I'm a musician. I write yeah. fucking music, and that's what I like to do. And the I, I had the, all this material that I'm like, oh, this is really good. Yeah. And it didn't work for Burn, and I wasn't gonna do it. Like you know, I was like. And then I had a couple people. One of them was a big champion. Mine was Artie Shepard from uh, Mind Primitive Over Weapons. Matter, Arit- yeah. Mind Over Matter. Arit- he goes, why aren't you singing anymore? Yeah. You know? Because yeah. I've always hated my fucking voice. Up until recently. And mm. it's because I've been locking myself in a room during pre-production on this record. And really just like working on get, do, understanding what my voice does. How it works, right? And getting comfortable with it. Getting it's comfortable with it. Part. Yeah. When I do this, it sounds like that. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's awkward, but it's and it's fucking uncomfortable. Be, but right. comfortable and growth. It's very, most vulnerable you can be. Not, if yeah. Comfortable and growth don't go in the same That's sentence right. very often. Exactly. So you know, you're talking again like a martial artist. How? I don't want to derail you from talking about the uh, canonized, yeah. but then uh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but my question. <laughs> How long have you had, have you always had, I'm watching you, you're a process thinker. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm watching you. 
Now, have you always been like? Have you always been like that? Oh, no! Is that is that sobriety or have you always been? Because I'm. I didn't have. Like, here's the whole thing: is that I didn't have like the a process thinker is someone like basically who I don't act on my first thought. Okay, that's so smart. My first Working thought is it. just a. Oh, my first thought is usually the worst fucking idea <laughs> imaginable. I think we're in the same club, yeah. You know? I've learned yeah. to wait around for my second thought um, and give that time to breathe. Um, because, I mean, my first thought is, you know, very, very lizard brain. Right. Yeah, my, my um, significant other has called me on that. It's like, who told you that it was okay for you to say the first thing that came to your head just because you thought you were being honest and that was yeah. okay? Yeah. We, we have to work on that. So Yeah. And, uh, but you learn through, and it's through adaptation and making enough like mistakes of the learning hmm. variety that, you know, there's, I mean, now don't just... Uh, let me finish this whole thing. There's a whole thing like insanity is repeating the same process over and over again, expecting a different outcome, which is not at all true. In true insanity is repeating the same process over and over again, knowing damn well what the outcome is going to be. Mm. Mm. That's fucking insanity. Yeah. You know, the other one is just willful ignorance, okay. <laughs> <laughs> which I've been guilty of both. Yeah. yeah sure. Yeah. I have worn both dresses. Sure. Yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, but yeah, and it's I, it's taken a lot of time to understand that, and it's also know what it is. It's being a coach, mm -hmm. being a, being a coach, and being a martial arts instructor, and telling people that like, listen, make your fucking mistakes. A lot. You're not here. We don't expect you to come into like like PCC business plug. Yeah, um, give it. Give it. Physical give Culture it. Collective. Um, we don't expect you to come in and be like, oh, you, oh yes, you're a great mover, and oh, your martial arts is so great. If you already, if you already knew how to do Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu, you really would probably not be coming straight in and being like, okay, I need a coach, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you got to make mistakes because that's where the that's where the corrections lie, mm -hmm. and I think that a lot of that gets lost in martial arts gyms because people get this idea of like, oh, it has to be perfect. No, there's no fucking perfection. There's you can strive towards excellence, but there is no perfection. You know, there's no perfection. Um, case in point, let's bring it back to music. Yeah. Please. Burn, we have songs like if you listen to the original of Last Great Sea or Shall Be Judged, how they were originally recorded, that was a totally different songs now. Those songs in a way to me they they resemble a well graffitied uh, train car. Yeah. Because everybody's added on like little things. Everybody who's played yeah, on the little right. things. Yeah, and it's like and there's little things that have improved and embellished and made them. And I think that music should be allowed to do that because you always get these these um What's the term? There's a fucking scientific term. Cocksuckers. Um, <laughs> that are like, oh, the original version was, no, the original version was not better. You're just used to it. Yes. Yeah. When people, people, like, well, I'll take Last Great Sea. Sure. And like, oh, the original version with Don Fury was better. My personal taste, quite honestly, you're going to put Kurt Ballou in one hand and Don Fury in the other hand. Two totally different things. Sure. I think Kurt Ballou's version of that song is way more in depth and yeah. has more meaning to it. Right. The, and 25 the, years different. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and, and the, 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 the Don Fury version which was recorded in a rush like boom bap right. you know was not you know, like right. I think that Don has done some great stuff like right. the, the victim and pain record right. the Gorilla Biscuit stuff I don't think Burn was his was something that he really could bring to and everybody's like oh the first EP the first EP is a bunch of impetuous fucking kids in a room and that's and you, but, can't, you can't beat that fucking energy that's no. right and that's the part is that what needs to happen is people not to be so comparative between a thing and say yeah. this is better it's difference and yeah. you should be able to embrace it and you might prefer one and nobody's gonna argue you Absolutely. preferring one or the other but but, but difference I'm is amazing. As the artist, yeah. don't tell me how to do my fucking art. Never, fucking never, art. never. Yeah. And, and don't music. Don't tell me how to do my. Uh, as a music fan, how good is it 
to hear a different version. It's why I will listen to a live fucking, I don't know, whatever. Whether it's a Black Flag record or a Kiss record or fucking Led Zeppelin. I'll listen and hear the different shit that they're doing. Or a different like recording version. got shit on for like, when they came back, I was like, ooh, Quick Floyd. Yo, I personally love that trippy shit, man. That's great. And I'm a huge fan of fucking DJ Sergio Vega for president. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, and Walter, I, I love those guys. And I think that they have done more to expand what we've done as a medium. Yeah. If you look at quicksand, no quicksand, no fucking Texas is the reason. No lots, of, no, no lots, no lots, of lots stuff. Of, yeah. Let's be real. So right. you know what? They're 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 statesmen. Let them do it. Like and they no go one, away yeah. for eighteen years. You want them to write the next thing? I was actually thinking about Walter with you because you're a pretty prolific artist. But there's been a couple periods where you didn't have stuff coming out. One, what was going on there? Were you just because you were saying like I was you have songs music. for my dog? Yeah. Um, basically, that was it. There was a certain point where I was almost like I don't know if I'm done or not. Um, but I had people, you know, like you know, like my girlfriend is like, "What the fuck are you doing?" Yeah. You know, like, why are you not working on music? Why? Not? And I was, but I just wasn't putting it out there. And I t- kind of was like, you know. I had become like an artistic recluse. Right, yeah. No, I think that's something you know? that happens to people. You know? I have what good friends the, who do that. You what know? was the thing you released previous to that, the newer Burn 7 inch? What was the thing before? Like, it was between Pry and Burn, there was. We did Absolution. Yeah. That's right, 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 right. We did, we, we did, uh, we, we re, we re recorded the EP. Right. Yep. And then we did another, like, three songy thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, was there something else? I feel like you were in what? A different project. What right? Big Collapse? Yes. Yeah, I played was, bass in Big Collapse. Right. Um, but that's that something was, I think we, we gotta get into is the kind of idea of creation and expression. Like you've described yourself, you're a music fan, you're an artist. That that time where you're not expressing yourself, what what is that? Just you were focused on different things, or you're like I was focused on different things. Yeah. I think at that point I got a lot into. I was coaching a lot. Yeah. I was you know, like working with. And it was weird because it's like I approached coaching the same way I approached music. I was like, there's got to be a better way to do this. Because at a certain point, like, it was, you're, you're seeing a lot of, like, especially in, and I don't like the term combat sports. You're like, combat sports, it just sounds so funny. Very monster. Yeah, right? yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, here's the thing about Most it, man. Do. Like, it, it's, yeah, it is. It's extreme. Yeah, um, <laughs> what we teach, what we teach is skill based play. In all actuality, it's skill-based play. Mm. A a great story that I've reiterated a ton of times. Had a young kid come into uh, come into our into our dojo, and he's you know he wants to train and he trains with his friends in the park and he goes, "You don't understand, man. I'm a warrior." And I looked at him and it was funny because I was just getting done training this client of mine, who's a professional fighter, also a professional fireman. My next client who's standing right next to him, this gentleman, Jim Nash, mm-hmm. who's done a host of tours in Iraq. Yeah. Mm. And I look at this young, beautiful kid. Yes. And I'm like, so you've run into a flaming building to save lives. <laughs> and he kind of looks at me baffled. And I was like, yeah, he has. Yeah. I said, you've jumped out of a gunship over Kandahar with a 50 caliber on your back. And again, that same... I was like, he has. Right. And I looked at him and I said, buddy, I said, I, pro- I fought professionally. Yeah. I'm not a warrior. So you tell us what, what your friends what, in the park, huh? Yeah. What, we, uh, <laughs> what we do is hobby sport. Yeah. And I'm not belittling what you do. Right. But, yo, let's keep this fucking real. Right. You know, I, I, no I, one is storming the castle. Yeah. You are not, you know, it's like, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 like the existence of a society as we know it does not Rest on your five rounds in the ring. You ain't he man, man. Yeah, I, I straight up love the idea that somebody looked you in the eye and said, "I'm a, I'm a warrior. warrior," and I, I wish to have that level of confidence. 17, someday. Yeah, right. seventeen is a hell of a drug. Yo, man. seventeen yeah. is a hell of a drug. I'm yeah. a warrior. I don't know if I would have had that myself at seventeen yeah. to be able to do that. So I apologize for cutting you off earlier. Let's get let's get back into what you're doing right now. What made so y- your girlfriend's telling you? 
you're you're singing to the dog too much. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Let, dog put, songs. You got enough dog songs. Let's, let's get some. Let's get some of this out. The, let's dog, put, the dog is hilarious actually because I sit there doing my vocal warmups and he just he sits literally sits on the couch barking at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Musashi. Anybody who knows Musashi Beautiful is a personality. Dog. Yeah. Um, but uh, so it was weird because I wasn't really doing I. Was di- we had done absolute? We done some shows with Absolute. Yeah, right. amazing. Yep, yeah. You know those were like, man, fun. They're so much fun. Dan Cavan and Andy Guide are great to play with, and there's few front men I find as fucking magnetic as Gingy Brown. Yeah, yeah. You know, he is just. Yeah. He is a he's you know, motherfucker. He's just. I he's think, like Mingus, man. He's just so cool. Yeah. I think outside of New York, that legend doesn't ring as loud as it does here. Right, but yeah. people here. Yeah. Really no. seem to recognize that. Yeah, I, like the OG but, B-boy fucking. But absolution yeah. outside of New York, you just—it's not a conversation. Oh, you know and it's—it's it's sad because there's ba- there's some band from Detroit right now whose name never in the game, and I'm a lot of people are catching on to it and they're like, this is cool. I'm like, yo, it's cool. Have you heard that song? Never that song will yes. make my brain explode. It's so good. So <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were but, hoping they sounded like Absolution. Nah, they don't. No. They we sound like we were an outburst. We were, uh, we had done that, and then uh, a good friend of mine, Sasha Jenkins, uh, who he works at Mass Appeal, which is right. Nas's magazine. Right. He called me. He's like, "Hey, yeah, I want. Why don't you come down? We'll, we'll just shoot the shit." And uh, I went down and talked to him, and he was like, hey, "This burn thing," because I guess cousin Joe had hit him up. Sure, sure. You know, because there's a bunch of people like people him, were pushing for this for years for, for the and burn years reunion, and years, yeah. 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 And because uh, there had been when was the last burn show before that 2002 two? Two, yeah yeah yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and that was a very different Gavin Van Vlack at that point that's right that's um, right yeah. can yeah. I tell my because we can do my 2002 now. story sure yeah I've oh, told yeah. you this story before I'm not gonna it's not a okay. surprise yeah yeah go so we're playing a show in, in the Philly. Rotunda yeah. in Philly Most Precious Blood Count Me Out Time Flies and Burn now I'm a gigantic Burn fan Vic 108 is playing second guitar. Mm. I'm a fucking complete 108 fucking lunatic too. So we were the weird band that nobody watched, so everyone stood outside. Two of the people that didn't stand outside were Vic DeCara and Mr. Van Vlack. Ah. Mr. Van Vlack decided to heckle me. <laughs> so I, different Gavin Van Vlack. Yeah, so I go, yeah. I, I was like, I was going to like make a, like a Dion 16 comment, like a song title. Just that, oh, like, okay. Okay. just the record. Yeah. I, I see you. I, I see you. Sixteen. The record that Gavin sings on has a song called "Thurston Moore Don't Tip." So I was gonna say that. True or false? It's true. <laughs> <laughs> so I was gonna say this, and I'm neither like, does Lee Geraldo. No, mm. interesting. So Sonic keeps surpri- their money to themselves. That, that one's yeah. kind of surprising. Mm. So well, the, like, you know, the legend behind that, right? Is because Cooper used to work at the knitting factory, and. Uh, like they used to drink for free all the time yeah. in there, and never and tip they out. never tip. That's never shitty. Yeah. 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 So drink I for made free. That joke. Life hack: drink for free, tip well. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, I should say this, but this dude will definitely fucking kill me if I say anything, because <laughs> I didn't know him yet. So I was okay. like, fuck, I'm not gonna say it. So years and years later, you know, we become friendly and everything, and I was like, now you heckle me. He goes. It was a really bad time, man. I'm really sorry. <laughs> and I was like, it's cool. Like it's fine. That's like, that's like I mean, literally, like people who I've I. I don't remember. We've met once before. I'm like, well, let me apologize in oh. advance. <laughs> yes. yep. Yep. Familiar. So, so fast forward. Sasha hits you up. It's like, hey, yeah. Burns like, like get, shows you know, up. and uh, he he's, like he schedules a meeting between me and Chaka because we weren't we hadn't talked in ages for a while. Um, and uh, so we agreed to do that. We we were like, yeah, let's let's do it. Let's you know, and we brought in uh, Manny and Manny Carrero and Daraja Lang from mm-hmm. uh, Glassjaw. Uh, and uh, we started doing shows and then it, one thing led to another and we ended up doing like you know a bunch of shows um, was that like any was that in, in the plan at all what like going past Black and Blue Bowl was it like I didn't want to do it if it was just I didn't want to I didn't want to do a reunion that's I don't yeah, that, like, to me it has to be yeah. a, it has to be something that, that works right, right. No, that makes um, sense. so that's where we've taken that and that's mm-hmm. where that is now um that being said, now what I'm doing with Canonize, which yeah. I'm still doing Burn, you know, and I don't have any, you know, like, oh, are you leaving Burn? I'm like, I, no. I made that mistake already. Yeah, okay. Like, I left Burn to do Why Die 116. I could have easily done both of those bands. Right, and that's something that right. right now we're finally figuring this out with people. It's like, oh, you can do more than one creative endeavor at a time. And it right. just means, oh, I'm just going to press pause on this for a minute and do this. Yeah. And, and then go back. Oh, and, yeah. oh, we got some shows. Okay, cool. Yeah. Let's go. You know, right. it's fun. Yeah, and... uh 
So, um, yeah, the canonized thing that I'm doing is basically, it's taken a long time for me to get, like, to get the confidence, honestly, to be like, okay, I want to front this, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm bringing in two other guitarists, myself, I'm playing guitar also, nice. bass player, drummer. Hey. Hey. Hello. Come on in. Um, you know, Come and... Uh, <laughs> but, right, you know, right now I'm in the songwriting process, so I've been really lucky to, like, the, like bring in, like, all these awesome musicians. Again, I brought in Manny Carrero, mm-hmm. um, like, Tucker Rule from Thursday, Abbas Muhammad, who's played with Burn. Oh, yeah. Um, Chris Enriquez plays with uh, Spotlights and Primitive Weapons. Um, uh, Taylor Macklin, who played with Orange 9 Millimeter. I'm talking with him about playing on some tracks. Uh, Chris Vital, who was with Orange 9 Millimeter. Just people who I know who are musicians who I've, I, I really dig. Um, I'm talking with like, this woman, Sasha Heinzman, who's a monster bass player. Uh, I've shot like shot it back and forth like uh, Billy Reimer from uh, Dillinger about playing yeah. on it on a cut, yeah. um, you know. And I'm just trying to do a record that I'm, I want to have fun doing. And it's, like a lot of it too is like um, like Rob Robbie Vital Babitz right. mm-hmm. is uh, been helping me a lot like vocally like because yeah. he's anybody who doesn't know Robbie he's probably one of the best vocalists. He's a, just a stellar voice. He's a trained yeah. tenor, yeah. you know, tenor in opera as a child. And grew up in the hardcore scene. Right. Um, uh, Honey Child Coleman from 1865 is going to be doing some, lending some voice on it. Um, just I want to do a record with a bunch, a bunch of people, and one of the people that's been really, really important in this is Travis, uh, Travis Bacon. He's been engineering and help and like basically helping produce it, and uh, he's just amazing to work with. He's just fun. He's a fucking great sense of humor. Really open to like ideas. Um, we understand each other's process. Which is why I like I have a very exacting process where I, like I don't I'm not like the kind of guys who yeah I'm just gonna go into the booth and spit fire right I don't I believe that's selling yourself short mm-hmm. because I like to I mean I'm a big fan of good lyrical content you know and I'm not you know it's like right. you want the, to get it means it means a lot to me to have lyrics that me actually means something and it's sure. a dude who spent yeah. a lot of time with a guitar in your hand with other people yeah the lyrics. How much does that mean to you as somebody who likes music, the lyrics that are coming through? Super important. Super important. Super important. I mean, you wrote a lot of the Burn lyrics, correct? I've written a decent amount of the Burn lyrics. Right. Yeah. yeah. Numerality um, with you. Numerality, out of time, uh, unfuck mm-hmm. yourself. Right. Which all of a sudden that term's flying up all over the place. Right. Um, so there's, a, there's, there's a book now called Unfuck Yourself. Yeah, right. Some you watch the shirts. They're Angel coming Olsen soon. That's too good. What's this? Watch out for shirts with that because that's a good saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good term. Um, but, uh, yeah, and it's uh, you know, it's, there's you can tell the different the definite difference between like my lyrics and Chaka's lyrics. Right, we, mm-hmm. we write, we have a different, diff, we have a total different uh, like working style. order. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know, the Die One Sixteen stuff, you can tell like my I style of mm-hmm. lyrics. You know, I, I'm just a little grittier about stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and uh, but it's it's been really interesting because I'm like. Really, like you know, I, I go down to my HQ, my rehearsal space, and I have my workstation set up, and I go in there with my computer, and I have a, a you know a mic that's set up to my interface, and I will just sit there just tracking vocals and getting used mm. to my voice, and I'm starting to hear stuff I'm like, oh okay, well, this this is really cool, and I'm really excited about some of it, you know, it's like right. I'm really excited honestly about all of it. I'm trying oh, to get God. ten songs together, and I had some people who were like, you should do. Someone was like, you know, you should do like a crowdsourcing thing to get the money up because the more and more I'm looking at it I I, I I would like to get with a strong label but the thing is I don't know if I have the resume to sell what I I mean I'm really kind of just selling it like hey this is my thing yeah. and I'm, I want to put a band together around it I want to find some people who want to make something work right you know that are willing to come in and like okay here's the format this is what we're going to do um and you know, put it on a stage and put it on the road, yeah. and do it legitimately. But I also have a vision of how the record should be laid out. So I kind of, and I can kind of do that. So I don't want to take up other people's time with that. Yeah. So well, right, and have that you know, friction of like how you want it to be released, how they want it to be released, and kind of. You know. Yeah, but if it's a value, sometimes you can put it out in the world. People will see it's a value, 
and that's all you need. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I know you know yeah. this, but like, I, I just... I think there's people who listen who maybe don't understand that. You well, know? sure. Because I, I think there's a value to going and performing it and doing that and having fun with it. But if it's just the music on its own merit, it can yeah. mean so fucking well, much. Well, the thing, the thing is now that we, we have to look at what the record industry has become, and it's mm. changed massively, yeah. you know? Um, so it's like, uh, you know, you need to... The business end of it, which you have to be really, really smart about, you know, bands sell that we sell if we sell vinyl we sell it on the road mm-hmm. ba- you know labels don't sell a lot of vinyl anymore no we were just saying that um, yeah. so if I do this this record on my own I'm probably going to go in pressing like three to five hundred yep and looking to be able to sell a decent amount of those via email yep you know, via via mail yeah. um, you know and I, that's the thing too is that I want to be able to put good like I love what what Jacob did with the burn record mm-hmm. because we talked about the artwork on it, and there's a certain aesthetic that I really like, like the James the JG uh, Thurwell mm-hmm. kind of art and like the stuff that was on the Cop Shoot Cop records. Like, right. there there that's what that's the stuff that really speaks to me, and he he nailed it. Yeah, and that's the thing is like you know the artists that I'm talking, I'm talking with like Orlando, Orlando RC and like people like that about the art. And I, the art is really important too. Yeah, you know, because you right, want to sell a whole package. package. Yeah, we course. talk about it all the time. There's records that we're like, yeah, yo, I didn't. I looked at the cover and I don't like it. We talk about how the art impacts you to check something out or not, and it's a part of the whole thing. You know, this is part of your expression. So yeah, so um, which is a lot because you know I'm, I'm going from being. I'm sorry, don't don't mean to yawn. It's um, very late right now, so yeah, we're yeah. hitting you're getting yeah. a couple. We're you know as I'm going from being the guitarist to being like looking at it and being like okay I'm like now I'm like the fucking marketing director and like <laughs> all of this stuff and you know it's and you look at the 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 pieces that go into like having a publicist and having you know and uh, I know there's a lot of there's there's some awesome awesome you know 19 year old kid who's listening to me going like I don't need a fucking publicist no you don't. But it's good to have. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. You know, it's good to have a publicist. It's good to have... I mean, thankfully, I have a lot of really cool connections like with like Revolver Magazine, Kerrang! Yep. Brooklyn Vegan, stuff like that. And, I mean, that's stuff that I've started to try to access as well, too, for some of our athletes. Like, um, this one athlete, uh, Sarah Carswell, I was talking right. about, we, I'm, you know, like, we're working on a little project of trying to, I'm trying to get her on podcast. I'm trying to get her right. on mm-hmm. different things because she's, she's a vegan athlete. She's a right. gay vegan athlete, Amazing. you know, right. in combat sports, so to speak. Yeah, right. And, uh, I really, you know, I think she's got, got a great message. I think she's a fucking, I think she's an amazing person. And I think she's someone that like, you know, it's the same thing as like, you know, someone heard that fucking, that Bad Brains work a set and it stopped them from eating a bullet. Yep. Someone could hear a podcast from a woman like her and be like, hold it. Yeah, that I want to do that. I can do this. Right. I can right. do that. Yeah. And what we need is we need more more people like that. Like that, that I mean, that's what I, one of the reasons I'm putting out the I want to do this canonized record because yeah. I want people to be like, oh, wow, yeah, I want to do something like that. Not yeah. exactly like that, but I want to do that. I, you know, right. And it's scary. It's fucking scary because you constantly, I mean, I'm listening to stuff going like, wow, that sounds fucking amazing. And what if you're the only person on the planet that thinks that sounds amazing, Gavin? Because that's, okay, yeah. so that's Story the radio. Story of my life right now. Well, yeah, that's, right, the, right. that's the radio broadcast from Van Vlakistan. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the, like, WK Fuck, the radio station that's, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. located right between my ears. It's sponsored yeah. by tequila ads and cocaine. Because you're going, you're going, yeah. this is good. Yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. you're the yeah. only yeah. person who thinks so. Yeah, you I, I've said this on this podcast probably 11 times. There's a, uh, Angels of Light. You a fan at all? It's that, it's that Jira stuff after after swans yeah. so whenever i think there's mm-hmm. three songs that are like i don't cry they make me wanna you know yeah. what i mean they're just so impactful so fucking they, they, it just draws it out of you they're special fucking songs he was working construction the whole time because nobody gave a fuck right that, that's that keeps me up at night you want to talk about like from van vlakistan when you're when you're sitting there going 
damn, does anybody on else on earth give a fuck about this? I have well, come to the anyway. conclusion, no. But I, it, but it keeps me up, and I have the same fucking crisis of conscience where I'm like, damn, the thing that I think might be the prettiest thing I ever heard was also so fucking underrated in its dude time. Was, was breaking bricks <laughs> that during he, the day. That he was a forty plus year old fucking breaking bricks. You know what I mean? Fuck. Yo, I remember, and Jenny will, will speak to this when. Mike Jira lived up the block from us. Okay, there's a there's there's a hookah bar called Horus, which used to be a Pakistani deli back in the '80s, and he lived in a little room that was basically like the size of this mm. in the back of that, which had its own access door, and uh, uh. he lived there. And I remember Hank Rollins used to stay there with him. Yeah. Oh shit! Yeah, cranky Hank. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, it was funny, and I, I only call him that because, like, I'm one of those guys that, like, even when, at my most asinine, if I see someone on a, on a, on a daily basis, I'm going to say hello. Yeah, right. And if I say hello to you more than three times and get nothing back, then You're an ass, I'm yeah. going to give you a nickname. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God, that's right, Hank. Say no more. Yeah. Once, twice, three Cranky, times the lady. Yeah, me, me and Cooper would call him Cranky, Cranky Hank. Hank. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not Cranky Hank. He's just walking around all, you know, surly and furrowed. And <laughs> but I mean, isn't that the fear of, of anything that you're putting out there in the world? No is matter what, no, it is. is this good? But I mean, that's part of it. You said this. Uh, growth and comfort not yeah. the same yeah. thing. And you that's the thing walk, you got to put. You have to walk through fear and every. All. Mm. all all of your dreams, all of your dreams lay outside of your fucking comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Comfort everything, is familiar and easy. Yep. You know? Everything you want, everything you want lays outside where you've been. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And I'm not, and I'm not saying this like, oh, well, I'm, you know, there's that centered person who's like, well, I'm perfectly happy with what I have. And then that's fine. I'm not. I'm. I'm. That's more, not me. Yeah. No. I'm more I mean, ambitious. Right. Yeah. Isn't I that only, a weird? Could I you imagine a, the feeling of satisfaction? I have a sated? limited amount of time on this fucking mm-hmm. rock, and in that time, I want to do something. And I've had, like, I'll tell you, man. One of the fucking radish things that happens is getting stopped on the street and someone being like, "Your music is really important to me." That's fucking. That's big. Yeah. yeah. That's really fucking big. Yeah. You know? And it's like, I never thought I'd hear that. You know? I never thought I'd fucking hear that. You know? Because it's like, you know, know, who the fuck am I? You know? It's some half-breed kid from a swamp. Right. (laughs) You know? Um, Do you find this to be more kind of nerve-wracking because it's like completely your baby and it's your voice on it? Is that scary? Then like coming back with a burn, like the first burn LP that ever existed. Is this even more kind of like fuck like this is really going on on a limb oh, yeah it is it, it, there's a lot to it that makes it like it's it's scary because you just you know it's like you're fucking naked yeah you're like, naked you're, this is you. you're, this is your you're stripped yeah. the fuck down right you know you're vulnerable as fuck right you can hide behind a Les Paul but when your yeah. voice is out there it's different yeah yeah and uh it's um I mean, but all the way across the board because the whole, the art will be my idea. Everything will be, and, you know, and again, it's like, again, you know, I'm trying to please everybody and I'm foolish for that. Right, you gotta make I'm not going to please everybody. No. There's always going to be someone who's going to be like, oh, it's not as good as this or none right. of his stuff is any good or, you know. Right. And Fuck there's people. someone who I pissed off out there that, you know, it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's you where know. my brain goes. I always go, what did I do to you? Yeah. 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 Don't buy the record anyway. <laughs> what happened? Yeah, I, must have, I must have been drunk. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so it's, you know, but my, my process, I have, you know, I don't know how other people go about things. I can't, like I said, I can't, and I don't like waiting to the last moment. I like having things mm, laid right. out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I spent on the Do or Die record, and Jenny will tell you, I spent, I woke up every morning at 6 o'clock by 6.30, was sitting at a table writing material. Right, like it was oh, your job. Wow. Like it was, yeah. it was for, your job. Yeah. For four fucking months, sending, sending, sending stuff to Kurt, being like, what do you think of this? Because yeah. this is right. good. This is, this is we can, like, can you do this? Can you do that? He goes, or, or he'd be like, yeah, this is a good song, but it's not a burn song. 
Yeah. Right. You know, right. and a, a lot of that stuff is coming up on the canonized right Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Like, Are you start, you're starting to feel like you know what canonized is. Oh, yeah. yeah you're oh, feeling yeah. that. And that's, I mean, the thing, canonized is not going, I mean, it's not going to be, it's punk rock in the way that Killing Joke is punk rock in a way. Yeah. Right. You know? Sure. And anybody who wants to argue, oh, Killing Joke's not punk rock. Yes. Well, that's my fucking punk rock, okay? <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> you know? Um, September 12th, playing the city. You gonna go? Probably. Where He's trying it? to set up a date. Irving? <laughs> uh, it might be Irving. I think it is Irving. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. It's it's one of the two things I I'm excited about on my little. I have my yeah, little. I'm excited. I'm about excited thing. about with young. It, it, it's, uh, it's uh, a solo uh, Jira thing, and then uh, Killing Joke. Where's Where's Jira doing the solo thing? I don't know. I think it's gonna be a small Ur room because it's not Swans. It's just, but yeah, so I, it's not I, Warsaw. Warsaw. Probably not. Well, didn't no. Swans do their last? Don't they? With that lineup or something? Yeah, it's, it the some last kind of... it's the last with that lineup, which means he'll go to the well for solo shit and then come back, hopefully, doing quiet shit, which is what I want from him at this stage in his career. Yeah. But uh, I'm excited to see him in whatever fucking context. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? And uh, the last Killing Joke show I saw, which I think was that Irving, was the best live show I'd seen in You years. raved about I it at the time. I had the, the best last time I saw them was time. on the Extremities Tour at the 930 Club. No shit. <sighs> fucking amazing. Yo, when you, taking into consideration these men's age, yeah, unbelievable. So this is something we. Joy is one of my main influences on guitar. Yo, that's sick. That's I, sick. Yeah, that's them. We talked about yeah, this. I for them for like, and and we got an email about shows. this. That's awesome. About as we're starting to go in, and there's more more people of age getting a little older who are into alternative or aggressive music. That you said this, like you would put yourself up against any twenty year old out there doing it and you feel aggressive and you feel good mm-hmm. yeah. and I had a friend who's about the same age about 40 who's like yeah I feel like a 23 year old should be blowing me off stage but he's not and I think that's an interesting thing well, there's to think a, about there's a, lot, there's a lot of that and it's funny because now there's a band of course that already Shepard is in called Ageist yeah. Yeah. you know yeah. and a lot of like we like I remember some kid coming up to me and thinking this is hardcore he's like yeah, burn, man, like dead mosh. And I looked at him, and I was like, yo, I will bend you over and fuck you <laughs> like your dad did. You know? Yeah. It's like what that kind of... What is wrong with it's people? Like, I know. Well, the, here's the thing, and this is, this is going back to that situation that happened that someone basically accessed those tools in mind. Yes. Okay? Where they Push the think, button on your neck. Yeah, they, they think... They, they think that like, oh, well, he's grown up. He's gone beyond that. Or, oh, he's soft in the tooth. Mm-mm. I'll tell you, man. There's one thing, and I'll say this. Once you hit a point at like 35, you realize, especially as an adult male, the one thing that you, one of your biggest fears is quite honestly, at least with my background, is walking into a room and not being taken as formidable from other men. Mm. You know, nobody wants to feel like they've had their teeth cut. Mm. And I am still, you know, I'm 50 years old. I'm still a practicing martial artist, mm. you know. And, you know, but I, one, of, one of my best training buddies, Craig Satari, you know. Yep. And Craig, Craig for an, not even for an older gentleman, yo, homie throws bombs. <laughs> yo, he can drop fucking punches and... It, his timing is so friggin' precise. His feet work. You know, his footwork. Uh, so I, I, I just want to say for the people at home that uh, I, I, I'm I'm looking at Gavin. Not a man I would test. You no, know, why I mean? would you ever think I'm, this is the guy I, I'm going to say something yeah, stupid? Well, the thing is, because people think that like, you know, like, oh well, he's you know he's old. It's age ain't nothing but a fucking number. Mm. Well, I, I just also think like, it, look, there's somebody that'll. Test anybody. I'm, my, not, my, try, yeah. my, I'm not built like a typical man of my age. No, I'm, you know I. Mm. You know I don't want to be staring at you like it's size, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like I'm like si- I'm, size, I'm, well, size, I'm sizing I'm sizing here's you up right now. I'm just going to say Japan, that it's not Japan, worth it. Last night in Japan, there was an MMA fight, huge MMA fight, and one of the biggest winners was. 51 year old gentleman by the mm. name of Hanzo Gracie. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah okay. You know? <laughs> yeah, well. And they we're talking a lifelong martial artist. Mm. I mean, and he's carrying the legacy of his father, Helio, 
who was competing up to, you know, not competing, but still was doing jujitsu. Until it was like 70. Like, yeah. Until it was like, until he yeah, died. Uh, until he yeah. died. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing. That's like what a martial artist does, mm. you know, and that's the thing. Like, age is little but a number. Mm. You know, you look at John Joseph. John Joseph, who's still competing actively in Iron Man. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Jason Surface from Crackdown, another one. He's another Iron, he's another, I don't know a lot that. of people, yeah, a lot of people, uh, that we, he doesn't promote it as much as like, you know, because he's, he's also a forest ranger. Okay. Oh, that's yeah, right. he's, he's, he's a game warden. No, yeah, game warden, yeah. That's yeah, the Iron, War, the Iron Warden. That's, <laughs> that's a good yes. band name right there, <laughs> the Iron, Iron Warden. Warden. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, he's cracking down on people. Yeah. That's, oh, my, uh, that's, my, that's my Iron Butterfly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, Iron Warden. yeah, I mean, and that's, that, that, that's mm. something that, like, you know, and I'm not, I don't walk around like I'm like, oh, I'm a badass, this, that, and the other thing. But, I mean, some, and it's an old, it's an old quote, like one, one of the, uh, one of the, one of the biggest solutions for bad people is good men who are schooled in violence. Mm-hmm. You know, mm. and uh, you know that's that's what it is. It's like you know using your force for good as opposed to evil. Um, but I don't. You know, it's like I said. It's one of those things that people get a little bit like, oh well, he won't do. The, never, ever, ever, ever think <laughs> you can push someone as far as you want. Right. No, you sure. I, I say this as a 130 pound man. I, I say all the I say all the time that like, I, I there's a certain amount of shit I have to eat. But then when you get past that, it's like, all right, I guess we're you know. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, okay, tough guy. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But and I say this as a tiny man. But it's just eventually. I think I agree no, with you. I'm much more eventually. scared of a bullet than a bulldozer. Okay, very yeah, good. That's true. <laughs> you know, I've worked with. I mean, I've anybody who's familiar with training in Thailand. You know, yeah. oh. I've trained, I've trained, I've trained with some 130 pound older fighters. And these are guys, guys that fought at 115 who are like, you know, 130 is a fat Thai fighter. When I, when right. I, I, went, to, I went to a fight in Thailand where children that looked yeah. to be a hundred pounds could easily kill me. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, but yeah, I mean, I'm working, working with these guys who are like, and these are guys oh, who, yeah. who basically, you know, like say at 26 years old have 300 pro fights. Fuck. Yeah, that's you know, crazy. and they're right. fast as lightning. You know, I've worked with I've worked with guys in Europe, tiny, skinny guys who are just lightning. Size size is not a, 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 you know, physical bulk is not a correlation to strength and mm. power. Mm. Mm. You know, so oh, physics. I, I, I don't want to keep you all night, but I do. Just uh, I'm curious about a thing. Uh, so you you have this complete martial arts trainer mindset like you are the thing that you advertise yourself to be just in the way that you talk there's yeah. a, like no mistake in it right yeah. but i'm curious in your personal journey when did you become that and were you prior to that were you ever the other thing were you ever when you were just let's let's say not training let's say not skilled were you the headstrong i'm a warrior were you yeah were you ever just beating people up for the sake of it were you ever a bully were you ever a dickhead were you ever a, the, a person that you wouldn't want to know were you ever the opposite of what you are today and you say that you, you you've transformed as a person you don't recognize that old guy yeah i mean but, i used to i was never i wouldn't say this is interesting because I was called a bully by people, like, because I would roll up on, like, five or, like, there was one situation, I remember, because I was a skater, and there was this kid I knew who was getting, he, on St. March, he was get, get, got rolled up on by, like, eight skinheads. Mm-hmm. One of him, eight of them, one more of me couldn't hurt anymore. So I basically, you know, and anybody who knows me from back in the day, one of my favorite weapons was a Santa Cruz longboard. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I ended up getting, I would get into fights like that and I would roll up on it because at that point we had a thing with like, there was like a lot of quote unquote Nazi skinheads. Mm. Not a lot of white pride, whatever the fuck that shit is. I had yeah. no fucking time for it. No. Um, but I I would get into shit and uh, I would get into a lot of fights and there were certain people, I'm not going to pull names. No. That would be like, well, Gavin's a bully because I was beating up their racist friends. <laughs> <laughs> you know, That's, we need more of those yeah. bullies. That, and That's these the are case, people yeah. within the hardcore scene who would be like, oh yeah, fuck racism. This, that, but would fence fucking walk. Yeah, yeah. Right. And 
Yo. Yeah, but but he's all right though. You know, he's, yeah, he's like, good. You know, but, yeah, he's you know, you're like well, screwdriver's really good. It's just the lyrics. Listen, man, I don't care if you've got a huge bowl of awesome soup and someone no. dips a piece of cat shit in there. I'm not eating the soup. It's cat shit. Right. It's yeah, cat that's, soup. Tom's <laughs> that's Tom's position. I might no, try the Tom's, soup. Tom's I might try the soup. Is, that's no good. And I'm like, yo, it's awesome, but you can't. I'm not eating it. Right, because I've, I've, I'm the one that's going on record on this podcast, possibly barring me from countries where I just said, yo, that first Screwdriver record, good. I don't give a fuck. Well, the first Screwdriver record is a punk record. It's yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. And it has no real racist underpinnings. Yeah. But there are racist records that I actually like. So I so I am on the... I, yeah, see, I don't... Yeah. I, I can't... No, yo, I, and I can say this, and I said this, like, the music is thing, but I can't separate the lyrics. I can't. I can't take uh, the catch it out. I can't soup yeah. spoon it out and it's go, stuff no, that good, draws no. me away from shit like David Allen Coe, who I love, but he's a fucking... He's a fucking racist, you know. I don't. I, I know, I, when I know, when you play the role of racist for so many years, it's mm, hard to say that you're not. Know. But I don't. I don't know. Point point is, I just couldn't sit here and be like, no, oh, I'm gonna, I, I I haven't said the screwdriver. No, we we talk so, about it. I'm good. I'm good with that. But no, that, that's also like. But here's the thing. Like at that point, was I kind of looking for it? Yeah, yeah. That was I'm totally yeah. looking for it. And there was an access there. There was an access. Oh, there's... You there's, had something to focus yeah, that on there, and go... There's, there, there is a plethora of flight jackets and boots to be taken. Right. It's. You I've know. got my weapon of choice, yeah. and I would like to hit something. Yeah. Oh, there's those assholes. Yeah. Good target. It's Wolfenstein yeah. because yes. it's always okay to <laughs> fucking hurt a yeah, Nazi. Yeah, Wolfenstein, you, know I mean? you can like, shoot yeah. the Nazis all day. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things is like, you know, and it's like... There's things that you take a stand on. Like, one of the most peaceful people I know, Sergio Vega, I saw him beat the shit out of a fucking Nazi skinhead. Mm. Sergio, anybody knows Sergio? That's like getting beaten up by Jimi Hendrix. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? You know what, though? I bet Jimi Hendrix is again. Is that a good story? I'd be willing missing? to. Be- Who's Jimi Hendrix beat the fuck out of? I bet he had heavy hands. Yeah. Apparently, in that thing with, uh, with, with Dre 2000, he beat the fuck out of his girlfriend, but uh, nah. uh, with a telephone. Uh, Jesus, that's rough. I but uh, like but no, I mean, and that's the thing is like, but we're talking Sergio Vega when we were like 19 years old, and Sergio, Sergio's Zulu Nation kid from the Bronx, mm. you know, um, and you know he's like one of the most lovely human beings I know, but you can only push a person so fucking far, straw dog style, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's like, I and mean, he grew up in like the Lower East, like he's not a fucking pushover, he's a nice dude, but like. Yeah, he grew up pretty well, fucking grew, tough. He grew up in the Bronx. He grew yeah, up in Woodlawn. Him oh, and Sergio shit. grew up in the same neighborhood. He's original Zulu TAT. Oh shit! Yeah, legit. Oh, I didn't know that. oh legit. Yeah, right. yeah. His cousin, like he's. I think his cousin is like Bio and Bio and Nicer are his cousins. Oh shit! Yeah, like oh, okay. legit writers. Right. And uh, yeah, but it's um, but yeah, there were people who were like, oh, Gavin's violent. Gavin's. The, you know the fault for all. The, I, I, I always heard. I always heard wild man. That, that that's been your rep for a long time. Is that just you were a wild person? You know yeah, what I mean? I was, like, at that time in the eighties, I was yeah. fe- I was feral. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so when, you know, like he kind of asked that, but there was a time where you weren't what you are now, which is a very in control, process driven. You see the physicality of what you do as a focus, yeah. and at that time it was not. Well, no, when does no. that shift? I mean, um. Well, a lot of that for me was after I started training Muay Thai, after I was like 21 years old, you just kind of like street fighting stupid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what brought you to Muay Thai? Um, AJ James. We'd all studied, like there was like a bunch of us, we were always going to like local dojos because like local martial arts instructors were kind of endeared to us. They were nice to us, like Ron Taganashi and guys like that were like, you know, trying to get these kids off the street and try to give them a positive direction. And, uh, Trying we, to convince you street fighting is stupid. Stupid, exactly. <laughs> and a friend of mine, AJ James, who uh, I will call him, he's kind of the godfather of Muay Thai New York, in my opinion, because mm-hmm. he was patient zero. He was the first one who introduced any of us to it. Because, um, I mean, this is what? Late 80s, early 90s, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. This does yeah. not exist. Well, there AJ, not- AJ, was, AJ was a kid from New York right. who basically, he worked as a, as, as a bike messenger, and he was just this uber athlete. Right. Super adaptive athlete. Right. And uh, he was an amazing dancer. He started working, I think, for Eric B. and Rakim as a background dancer. Oh, oh, shit. And then from that, he also had just jaw-droppingly good looks. Mm. Just a very good-looking kid. Right. Relate, he was yeah. a singer for that band enough. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. 
No, Kick it, burn, it's... funky style. That oh. bit's great. Oh, yeah. All right, there you go. That's and, cool. Uh, and uh, he parlayed the dancing gig into a modeling gig, in which we went as hardcore kids. All of a sudden, we're walking by the Gap, and AJ's like. 12 feet tall. Like, you know, it was like, you know, Staring at you from Broadway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, you know, and then he parlayed that into he was going to Europe and he's, he stayed in France for like, I think it was like eight months modeling. <sighs> that model life is nice, man. And uh, while Should've he was over there, he started turned it down. training at uh, Dakar's Muay Thai where Pupa Noy, who was like a legendary yeah, yeah. trainer, uh, was training. He came back and he was like, yo, dude, I got to show shit. you this. Yeah. And that was, from there it was on. Because I mean, it wasn't big in New York at the well, time no, like no, BJJ it, or well, Muay Thai or anything it's funny because a lot of people like they, 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 they there's 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 a person that they that everybody goes to is they say he was the first Muay Thai trainer before him there was no Muay Thai which isn't true I'm not going to mention his name because I don't want to glorify it and I don't want to slander it sure but and Aziz Nabib who owns Sitan was really the first Muay Thai instructor but right. He came over and he started selling it as, as Taekwondo because Muay Thai wasn't really marketable. Right. And everyone in high school, Every, we everybody wanted to do Taekwondo. Taekwondo. Right. Yeah. And it just Aziz, sounded cool, honestly. Yeah, and Aziz, Aziz is just like, he's such an amazing, he's an amazing coach. He's one of those right. people that when I can get around, I always like to like get a little bit of knowledge from him because he's got such a great, a real pedigree from Holland. And like, you know, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's an Egyptian Berber. And right. you know, ama- amazing athlete. He still play. He still plays Muay Thai. Still, still trains. Does pad work to say. You know. Right. And his 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 fighters are just so good. Yeah. So good. Just a great, beautiful style. Um, right. But that's what, how that whole thing started. When I started doing that, it was just kind of like, you know, it just didn't seem to make any sense. So, so I I've mentioned I have a f- small child, four years old, and he was going to one school. Are you selling him. Uh, no, he's not for sale right now. But uh, we will talk after the podcast off the air. Um, but he he had he was in a school and they were like, oh, he's and now I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Nobody else has ever said this. They don't see it. And we take him to a different school and they're like, oh yeah, we make sure they do this, that, and the other. And they're like, if it's nice or cold, we make sure they get outside. And you know, there's limits to that, but we want them to get outside because you know, their gross motor skills, getting out, running around, they need to have that. enable their fine motor skills. Which, you know, like, oh, he's learning to read and write and write numbers. And it was funny because, duh, right? Like, obviously. (laughs) But you see it so much enhanced. And I think about that with a lot of people. And I think about this duality of physicality versus creation and art and expression. People think they're two different things. They're not. They're 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 connected. And if you're, you know, you think about this. You're running around when you were the other, when you before you found this kind of focus to it. Yeah, you were still doing things, but it was just all energy everywhere all the time because it was, it didn't know where to go. Yeah, yeah. My, my mother works in education theory, and it's basically they. It's just all the research points to the fact that some people just have to move. Yeah, you know I mean? like some people just have to physically move to. Learn, and I think well, we a don't lot have to of worry about that because we have pills for everything, right? right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's Muay Thai, it's all creativity, right? Right, like, and thinking right. three moves ahead. And well, kind martial of, right, arts like, is problem solving, right? Right, and that's the thing. And like yeah. the brain is a problem solving organism, and if you right. don't give the brain that's, enough right. things, enough stimulus, right. what happens? It starts coming up with these fucking DEFCON one <laughs> scenarios in your fucking head, and it's like I tell people all the time: is like if you don't give your brain free time to like to, to daydream and do things and like mm-hmm. create like, yeah your brain will get angry and your brain will bully up on your heart and your heart is a child yeah you know and you leave your brain your brain will fucking go yeah just brain, go real brain up can go and really fucking bully. Hurt. Yeah. right and that's where you get this depression where you're just kind of like I'm nothing. I don't yeah. really right. matter. You know. Right. Right. No, and and you know, you said made the comment about pills for everything. Wouldn't it be better if we were actually having these conversations, like these public space? Like everybody should think about that for thirty seconds and go, "Oh yeah, you know, when I'm restless and have all this energy, it's hard for me to focus." Enhance that by child. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's I. It's I can't explain it any more simply than seeing it in the simplicity of a smaller human goes. Oh yeah, I can focus more if I'm not like once I get some physical stuff done. I'm doing things, I'm getting moving, then I can sit down and do the shit I need to we're sit down at, for. We're at a stage where if if you tell a depressed person, "Look, you've got to work on your body," it's considered insulting because right. pe- people say, 
hey, look, I, I have clinical depression. I don't want to hear that bullshit. And I, look, I'm sympathetic because, you know. Same. Ma- you don't want to put anybody in a place. Right. I, like, I don't want to. Well, the con- thing is, it gets into the whole thing. Like, oh, you're body shaming. It's not a matter of body shaming. No. It's a matter of getting the neurological output. Right. But that's, that's, what, I was, that's what I was driving yeah. at is, is uh, well, people, okay, you don't want to hear that shit. I understand that. Yes. But, you know, straight up. Uh, the people that I know who suffer any sort of major depression, it doesn't cure you to fucking be working out. But I'll tell you, it does not fucking hurt. It only no, helps you. No, and, and, and like, I think that people have all or nothing solutions to things. Yeah. Like, hey, I don't want to hear that I need more sleep. I don't want to hear that I need to work out because th- that's not going to get me over this hill. It's like, yo, it might not. But if it gets you fucking 10 steps up that fucking hill. The problem with is that people, we've, we've become such a disposable and instamatic fucking society where, oh, I, I need, oh, well, I feel down. I need some endorphins. What's going on in, mm-hmm. on Instagram? Sure. You know, we oh. need these quick fix things. Where it's like, oh, we want all. The, I want all the answers now. I want all the, like. Here's one of my favorite. I, I have a, a really good friend of mine who I go to, who's an acupuncturist. Mm. Um, we we're talking about like you know herbal medicine and like right now I guess like this whole uh, the uh, the kamba, which is this this frog medicine, mm-hmm. ah. poisonous frog medicine, okay. and then also the ayahuasca. Right, that one. That Which one I've everyone heard. is like, oh, I'm gonna go to Peru and I'm gonna go do ayahuasca and da da da. And here's the thing about it that you don't understand: ayahuasca is not going to give you your answers. Ayahuasca is going to highlight your problems in big glowing letters on the wall. Then you need yeah. to go. Yeah. Fix then you, then those. you go home. <laughs> then you go drugs, home. Drugs and alcohol are a low level spiritual. Sp- Search. Yeah. I didn't have ayahuasca. I used cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's all that was to me was some kind of like trying to find something to shut down the dialogue within right. my head. Yeah, you know, and everybody's like, oh, but if I go there, then instantly I'll have all the answers. No, no, the epiphany is like, you know, like you could speak to this better than I could. But everybody I ever know who got sober, yeah. the first thing they always say is, damn, I had no idea how big my problems were. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. <laughs> you're seeing them clearly for the first time. But this is maybe same thing with, you know, you go to ayahuasca expecting an epiphany. Here's the epiphany. you got to put work in when you get home. You know what yeah. I mean? Here's the epiphany. Yeah, but that's the right. thing. People are like, oh, I've, 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 I mean, people bragging me like, oh, I've done ayahuasca like DMT times. Yeah, I'm like, was, yeah. well, congratulations. So you're a junkie to throwing up and pooping. <laughs> <laughs> That just doesn't sound like my bag of tricks. Yeah, you know? I had a cab driver that was explaining it to me. He's like, "Yeah, we we uh, we're in a like a like a mound. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that, yeah. like a, like a little cave sort of thing. And uh, there's uh, twenty of us in the room, and they give us a, two buckets, one for vomit and one for shit. Mm, and and, mm. and uh, Sold. Buy yeah. my ticket. <laughs> well, that's exactly what I said to him. I said, oh, "You're not doing a great job of selling this one." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know I mean? But uh, I uh, d- d- anyway, all right. Let's not. L- l- we want to call it. We want to say. We want to give the gentleman an opportunity to pump the things that are important to him. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, it's, and yeah, it's that, starting to get long. I got a two and a half, a two and a half hour drive home. Oh shit! Where are you living? Uh, at the shore. Oh wow! It's more like and an hour and a half. It's nice. Beautiful. Yeah. Got the ocean. Thank you. So, tell me. Tell the people at home, rather, uh, about your gym. Uh, Physical Culture Collective. We're at 857 Broadway Broadway. on the second floor, um, right upstairs from Brooklyn Made Motorcycles, um, Brooklyn Made Power Sports. But uh, Wait, 857 Broadway in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. So Bushwick off the J and I lived at 805 for years. We talked about yeah, this. Yeah, the gym yeah, right the block yeah. You me. did. Yeah, you did. It's like up the block from Woodhall. It changed a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> go on. Woodhall, the death star of the medical industry. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're trying to die, but, good yeah, one. Yeah, exactly. But if you're trying to live, <laughs> yeah, like, ask for Bellevue. Yeah. yeah. You see people crawling out of ambulances <laughs> and they're going out, going to, to Woodhall. <laughs> so I'll, take, I'll take my chances <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> on the street. Um, but yeah, we um, basically what. We run is like I said. It's we we teach Muay Thai. We teach Jiu Jitsu. We have an amazing what I like to call an athletic development program with our strength and conditioning, mm. strength or conditioning, and all actually is what they should be. Um, 
but we're kind of, we're kind of a gym for people who don't feel comfortable in normal gyms. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of our members, like it's just like I mean, I, and then I'll get on my on my on my please my soapbox. soapbox here. Go for it about like gyms is like yeah they oh great you buy your membership oh good go get on that elliptical and watch that TV set. Here's the thing. Okay, that's exercise. I guess we kind of need exercise, but exercise is fucking unnatural. Mm-hmm. Who here owns a dog? I had one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. All former dog owners. Okay. Current, yeah. These they, cats they, out they here. These cats almost, don't yeah. exercise. These cats in the hallway, they'd rather play. Right. We as humans would rather play. Mm-hmm. And what martial arts is really is it's skill based play. Yeah. That can be used for self defense or for sport. Okay. Now we need exercise because we get clients, we get people in all the time that like they've forgotten how to move. Yeah. Mm. You know. So we get these movements back, which are really important um, because it helps with our alignment, it helps with everything, our mental state. Um, okay, so we got these movements back. Now let's incorporate them into some kind of play. It doesn't have to be martial arts. It could be tennis. It could be basketball. It could be rock climbing. The things about play is that it involves other people we don't deal with other people because to quote joe rogan we now have this disease that makes us stare at our hands yeah you know mm-hmm. we're just fucking constantly like ignoring mm-hmm. people trying to like connect through likes right um mm-hmm. and i think the community that we've built at physical Holter is really it, it's unique and i'm really proud of it and really happy with it and we've got i mean the people that that are on our fight team or people who kind of, they didn't come in like, yeah, I'm going to fight. They fell in love. I mean, that's my job as an instructor is to make someone fall in love with martial arts, you know, whether it be jiu-jitsu or Muay Thai. This is what I like as a musician. I'm trying to make people fall in love with music in one yeah. way or another. You know, I want to make something that someone hears and they're like, oh, that's fucking beautiful. Or, oh, my God, that's fucking amazing. Yeah. Wanna, you know, um, and my focus, my focus really at PCC PCC and our, our, our Muay Thai program is called Diamond Heart. Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu program is called Diamond Heart. Is that I want to create an atmosphere and a room full of the best training partners possible so that someone who comes up the stairs who's never heard of Muay Thai or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu before sees it and is like, oh, I want to do this. Mm-hmm. It's the same way we felt about like, we didn't really know what fucking hardcore was. It was just, mm-hmm. it, we heard it and we're just like, we saw it one day. What is well, this? this, yeah. this. You know, I mean, the best. So one of the, I, I'm sure you experienced this. W- 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 one of the most fulfilling and frustrating things is as a musician when you, when you feel somebody beat you to it. You know what I mean? Oh, when sure. you said, "I wish I had thought of that." Fuck. You There's know what I mean? There's a great story about that. Um, it's a Michael Jackson story. Uh, he was, I forget, I don't know what album he was working on, but he said to his producer, because they were grinding on this fucking one idea, trying to get it done. He goes like, we have to get this idea down or God, or God will give it to Prince. But I'm sure, I'm sure martial arts are a little bit like that, where you want to inspire that same sort of Fuck, you know. I mean, I wish I was doing that. I wish that I experienced that. I wish that I could have been the person to pull that off. You know, what I mean, like yeah. that, that. That's. I, I'm sure it's. There's a lot of parallels here that I. I think that's cool. Well, it's one of those things where it's like, and I try to make it to. Pe- I tell people all the time, man, because it's weird. Because in a lot of martial arts gyms, you, you get the, the yelling of like, "Come on, go harder, go harder." Yeah. No, no, take a knee. Mm. You'll go harder next week if you take a knee now. Right. You know. This is your limit. Good. Let's work here. Let's work here because that will change if you consistently come back and you make a practice of it. You know, it's like it's any, like anything. It's like songwriting. You have to make a practice of songwriting because that's it's a neurological thing that we adapt to. You have to make a practice of, you know, it takes 21 days to create a habit. Yep. And these are the things that you need to be able to do and make a habit out of. Um and uh, it's you know it's it, those the, the, we are not defined by by anything other than what we do on a regular basis. Sure, Behaviors. our habits are what define us. If you have good habits, then that is what you know. That is what's going to show. If you have bad habits, whether and even with physical culture, if you're overtraining. Yeah, that that flag's gonna pop up. Trust me. Mm. You know, over being overtrained is way worse than being undertrained, and we see it a lot, especially with with martial arts. People think that more is better. 
You know, we live in a very, in a world of very, like, right now, with like, the fitness industry, this extreme fitness. And I'll tell you what, everybody, no matter who it was, when you came out of the womb, you were in as perfect a form as you were going to be. Yeah. And to develop, you know, like, we end up at a certain point where we're, we're like, in pain, and we, you like, you know, I've had, you know, like, plenty of times people are like, oh, but you're always in shape. And, I mean, like, as, as red as my witness, like, I have a huge pain tolerance because I, like, from coming out of competitive Muay Thai, I would walk around being in pain being like, well, this is just what's normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not realizing that I don't have to accept that. Right. I can change that if I choose to, but I have to develop the habits and other, in, in order to change those things. So, you know? At, at, sometimes I living living in New York, it feels like this doesn't need to be said, but I realize that I am in a bubble a lot, uh, because I think it seems obvious, but maybe not. Anybody can walk up those steps, yeah? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, and because I think for. I want to give a shout out in a way. Uh, we actually do really well in New York, so there's a lot of different types. Well, of I actually wanted saying. to. You want to talk about the stuff you guys do on Fridays, Friday nights? Oh, this. I the, think that's this so uh, cool. Oh, queer fight school. Yeah, Milo Mendez, Coach Milo Mendez, and queer fight. Um, she's. Oh, we've we've given her a platform to basically do what you know we like to call a safe gym, mm -hmm. and it's for the LGBT uh, and trans community. Basically, it's for everyone. Yeah, you know, it's for it's for people who want to kind of get their feet wet in the martial arts, but feel weird going into like you know the open level classes. Even though everybody in the open level classes, the most awesome room full of people. You yeah. know, I mean, God, you get to, like Brian Audley, who's one of the nicest guys in the world. Yeah, yeah. Like, him and Brandon, like Chris Enriquez, you know, Dave Castillo. Everybody, our, our members that are, you know, our membership base is just such fucking awesome people yeah. but being a martial arts school people get like it's intimidating it's intimidating and yeah. I understand that so we've opened up we've opened up the, the Friday uh, 7.30 it's a donation based you know we just want people to come in and like experience it have fun with it you know and that's the thing like explore that that idea that concept that movement because it's important yeah. it's not just I mean, the point of empowering people and teaching self defense is one thing but the point is to bring the community to bring the community closer together especially now because and I, i've really tried hard to stay off the political bent because there there if there is such a divide and conquer of where they're trying to like you know they're they, you know they've, they've turned to the right against the left you just, it, they want you to see what the world in a binary yeah. for sure exactly yeah. and it's this like, or that we got to keep these pe poor people mad at these poor people yeah and then get them all mad at these these other people from this other mm -hmm. you know, walk of life. Right. Yeah, you know, and you know, it's like well, we fuck well, them all. We fuck it. Well, we we'll, we'll call poor yep. poor people group C. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like, and you know, it's it's we're just trying to pull the wagons around in a circle. Yeah, you know, such I like a cool that. idea. Such a cool idea. And it's you know, it's it's we've had some situations too because in in bed style there was there was some assaults going on of of of, of young women. And which uh, Dave Castillo, who's the owner of uh, St. Vitus, reached out to me. He goes like, hey, this girl lives right near, like my girlfriend and I, we keep an apartment near the gym, like right near your, uh, it was a block away. She was sexually assaulted. Jeez. And I reached out to her on, on Facebook. I was like, hey, listen, you know, if you want to come down and check out what we're about. And I was willing to like, at, and I said, I was like, you know, I'll, I'll do a care. I'll give you a month, month for free. Come down and see if this is for you. Yeah. You know, because right, right. it's like, to me, I think it's it's worth more to give that person the chance, like, you know, an outlet first off, because there's got to be a lot of anger there, but also um, the ability to be around a community and, and feel like, you know, like safe yeah. yeah, and have that. And it's really important because, you know, it's when someone takes your humanity like that, it's it's that's rough to deal with. It, it puts you in a very lesser than state and it's a lot of work to get out of that well and, and, i mean we talked we kind of talked down on the concept of comfort 
And there's two states of comfort to me. There's comfort that's kind of enabled laziness. Yeah. And there's comfort that's quite literally physical safety. Right. Yeah. And right. that's that's everybody's basically some, entitled to that. Everyone, yeah, absolutely. everyone's absolutely. entitled to that. And and what I'm getting from what you said and what the programs you run and the shit like it just it's a warm feeling to me yeah. is that martial arts are for everyone. Yeah. And absolutely. you're doing everything you can absolutely. from your basic classes to special stuff. It's just like let's make this something where everyone feels like they can come up these stairs. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. absolutely. Um, and it's funny because uh, there was something on last night. We were watching. Oh, it's the last night. The other night we were watching the finale of RuPaul's Drag Race, and I forget the the Greek emperor who had he had he had a wife, but he also had a boyfriend. Xerxes? No, 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 no. Xerxes was a uh, Xerxes was uh, was uh, Egyptian. Egyptian. No. Yeah. Uh, uh. Um, I want to I want to say it was I think it was Hadrian. Okay. Hadrian, and because Hadrian was like the first, like his his boyfriend had died, and he erected statues all over yeah. Greece of him, yeah. and but everyone was like, but he kept a wife also. Yeah, I tell you quite honestly, can we stop giving a damn about who you fucking? Yeah, yeah. So we're saying I don't care. I don't care who you love. I care that you love. Yeah, that's what's important. That's what's up. You know, yeah. and it's you know if we divide ourselves by like oh well. You know they're straight and they're gay and they're like that's just fucking black and white and just you know like point more binaries genitals. this or this you know, know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who the yeah. Fuck cares? yeah it doesn't yeah. matter yeah. and I'm not I'm not taking away the 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 years of abuse that have gone towards the gay community mm-hmm. of you know having to live having to live in a closet having to be like you know you know, like very secretive about yeah like everything that's gone on and so on and so forth and right. I, I, pick your deity but blessed be to fucking Marlon Brando <laughs> who wasn't afraid to fucking pull cards on people like the Reagans yeah. who were like Hollywood elite and then the second Rock Hudson comes up and says you know I'm HIV positive they turn their fucking back yeah right Right. They turned their fucking back, and right. you know everybody was so like, "Oh well, Marlon Brando and Richard Pryor." Th- th- are you not seeing the big message here? The big message here is that, like, you know, is that these people have had to live on underground. Yeah, some of the greatest, right. cr- most creative artists ever that we've ever had. Yeah, right. you know, were persecuted. A lot of times by their own kind, J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Right? And you think about you think about Ed what Koch. that goes. Yeah, you right. think about what that yeah. goes you to. Know? That kind of suffering, that kind of torment. Yeah, it's it's just inhibiting somebody who's got so much vibrancy and has so much to give the world at large. But the world at large is looking at him, going, "Wait, what? You're what? Exactly." Uh, did you see the Kosh documentary? It was actually excellent. It was I so haven't great. Seen it. Really good, but it was that was literally the whole thing. Like he had to like keep a girlfriend, yeah. so he could like move in the, the social and political circles that he was moving in. Well, let's talk it's about like, well, let's talk yeah. about like, let's talk about the other end of the political spe- spectrum and holding a beard. Mel Brooks, Mel Brooks, Is one he? of the most politically incorrect comic writers ever. ever yeah, you know, best thing to ever come out of Williamsburg. He's from Williamsburg. <laughs> yup. I did not know that. Yup. Watched the producers a couple days ago. Genius. So fucking good. Such a genius. Such a genius. Uh, all right, we're well, gonna cut it for time. Okay, but no, we got other. Yeah, uh, yep. we got canonized. We got burned. At yeah, it's, it's, we so, can make that all quick. Don't worry. Okay, yeah, it's canonized. Okay, so, so canonized. You told us about what we waiting for. Um, the record, the first EP, "Message in a Bombshell," is coming out on Essence Records out of London, England. Nice. Um, my boy Adam Malik's label. Uh, he's been gracious enough to do that. Uh, Shout out Essence Records. Essence is he's been he's such a fucking awesome person. I love that guy. Um, he was our tour manager when we just the last European tour. Um, I'm working right now on the new album, which I have the title for, which I'm not going to leak. Um, I wanted to, I want to put ten record ten ten good solid songs together, um, and uh, I'm going to release that. And I'm hoping to be able to do shows with it this fall. Right. Um, that it, we, it's not a project. It's a it's it's a it's a it's band. A band. Yeah. Right. It's a band. Very cool. Um, Burn. Well, as everybody knows, we did the the Door Die record is out. Um, I'm, I love that record. I'm yeah. really happy with how it turned out. We've got we did a, we did so much touring on it. 
Uh, we yeah, you guys the, really did. Yeah, That's the yeah. most touring Burns ever done. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. took the summer off. I mean, Chuck and I were both just spent at the end. Yeah. We're just like ah. Yeah. And he's got he's got his project. He's got his Ghost Festival's project that he's mm-hmm. working on right now. Um, I think they're doing something with Freddie Alva's label. Oh wow! Okay. Um, cool. And then, uh, you know, and like I said, that that where Burn is playing, we're playing with Candiria. Oh wow! Yeah. October twentieth at Brooklyn Bazaar. Nice. There which we go. Which will be. Crazy. I'm looking forward to that. It's going to yeah. be a fun show. Yeah. Um, the canonized the canonized thing. I'm looking to hopefully have that. Let's say October, possibly. We'll yep. see. Um, you know, as far as it goes, though, like promoters, um, I'm not. I like. I know where I'm doing. I know. Where, I know where I'm doing the first show. Like, and I'm I, right now. It's going to be limited engagements because I really want it to be something special. So, yeah. As far as it goes, I'm not looking to like. I will. I will be in touch when we're re- we're ready to book regular yeah. shows. Fuck yeah. You know. I like very that. Cool, very yeah. cool. Uh, power move. Not calling it a project. I think that that's very self limiting when people yeah. call. Yeah. Call yeah. It no, don't call it. Because it undermines the, yeah. the breath yeah. of the band. No, uh, it, yeah. I think honestly, even when you're a rapper, I think it's not a good idea to call shit a project. Like you know, every, every, this, everything you do is a continuum of yourself as an artist. And you, uh, yeah, you, undermines your art. Don't yeah. do your project. Yeah. It's like yeah. what, if project. Yeah. What? Yeah. Hell it that? reminds me of something you do with construction paper. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, Diorama. Thank you for being our guest today. Thank yeah, you yeah, so much for having me. It's awesome. You know, and uh, like, I guess in closing, and just go out, go out, be kind to each other, and fucking create. I yeah. really, I'm, I, I, whenever someone throws, like, I have like friends of mine who throw new music across, and it's always good because it's like sometimes you get kind of locked into what you're listening to, especially the gym because we have the same playlist we run all the time. Yeah. Um, uh, working and, out the tattoo the other day. Oh, nice. Like, all the things he said, Shadow all the things he said. said. Yeah, it was running good. through my head. Yep. <laughs> Whatever happened to those girls? Not sure. I think that was it. I think it was that one release. Yeah. It's got some hits. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I'd like to have you back at some point to yeah. talk about a thing that we, we got listeners of all types and a thing, I think your perspective, the Mexican in New York perspective to me is fascinating yeah. because we exist. A, a lo- well, <laughs> yeah. a lot of people from parts of the country that don't understand what I'm, that I'm, is. I'm a bad Chicano though because I don't really know a lot of Spanish. <laughs> no, nah, look, I think that there's a stereotype among people that are not brown that there's just brown unity across the board. Try and it. then when you talk to a Mexican living in New York, they will they tell you very quickly. It's very different. Nah. Yeah. You know, oh, you know, no, 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 no. So, so, especially, for, especially for us Blancos. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you look, look at, like, I mean, everybody's like, oh, well, Louis C.K. is Mexican. Yep. Steve Martin's Mexican. Yeah. Esteban Martinez. The Sheens. Yeah. That's yeah, the yeah. They sure. are. Yeah. Yep. But uh, it's just... It's a perspective that I don't hear very often on oh. in, in our in our world of guitar music, and I'd like to have you back. And to And if talk there's on anything that, that we but. our large view goal is to expand world views and have yeah. big ideas and big concepts. So yeah, and then we have Axe to have Craig on to do a comedy thing. Oh, we'd love does. to have Craig ahead and you on. Oh, together. I'd love to be on with Craig. Craig is awesome. We'll work that um, out too. I, I'm really psyched that Death Wishes. I mean, I love the guys at Death Wishes. Uh, Trey and Jake have mm-hmm. just been. Nothing but awesome to me, and working with Kurt Ballou was amazing. The whole crew over at Death Wish is really, yeah, I mean, I'm still in contact with yeah. them on a regular basis. Yeah. So it's like, you they're know. They're so rad. They really do yeah. it right. They know what they're doing. Yeah. So big shout outs to them. Thank you to Death Wish. Thank you to Triple B, our other sponsor. Yeah. Um, and uh, my Tom, Death Wish pick would be Do or Die. What we're going to do, we'll, we'll do one. Oh, we're doing we'll do, that. We'll we're do a, a record. We'll cut it yeah. at the top. Um, you got to be ready to at, uh, Where can we find us on Twitter? At Extra Grindcast. And you can email us at Extra Grind Podcast at gmail.com. And if you go to our Facebook, it is Facebook.com slash Extra Grind Podcast. That's right. And, uh, and, and you can reach your gym at. Uh, you can reach us at at Instagram at Physical Culture Collective. Um, we can be reached at www.physicalculturecollective.com. I can be reached personally at GVV Strong on Instagram or Gavin Van Vlack at Facebook or Burn. NYHC merch for Instagram. Canonized, we have the Instagram up, and that's Canonized Band at Instagram. Yep. Uh, I don't tweet. Yep. Homie, don't tweet. <laughs> all good. Homie, don't tweet. We're gonna, we'll put all his socials well up there so you can yeah. click them nice yeah. and easy. Um, and I like, you know, like, again, the two plugs I'd like to put out is also um, is at Instagram Queer Fight. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's so Coach cool. Milo Mendez's uh, thing that she's doing. And uh, musical plug. Gust, 
from Sweden. We toured with them. Do yourself a favor. Mm. Check them out. Cost. Right, Not well, on my radar at all. Check it we'll out. We'll check no. it out. All right. All right Everybody, thank you. thank you for joining us. Have thank a you. very good night. Thanks.